be live on YouTube. We will start. Okay. okay. So you have to just give the indication, Dr. Misha. Yeah, ma'am. Welcome, Dr. Jyoti Bali. Ready to see you. <clears throat> We are uh, live on uh, Zoom as well as live on YouTube. Uh, okay. This is Ranjit Sahu, marketing head of Waterbusen. So welcome you all to this uh, live webinar on fetal surveillance, saving the fetus. With this, I hand over the session to Vishal sir to take it forward. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Vishal Vahane, working as senior medical advisor at Walter Bushnell. At the outset, uh, Walter Bushnell expressed gratitude toward Delhi Gynecologist Forum for the chance to organize and coordinate this webinar. On the behalf of the company, I take the opportunity to welcome office bearers of the society, chairperson, moderator, speaker, panelists, and all attendees for the webinar on fetal surveillance. I would not add too much and briefly introduce uh, the uh, Dr. Ramnik Sabarwal. Uh, Madam is the senior uh, consultant of Shangani at uh, Sri Jeevan Hospital and at Fortis Lafem Hospital. She is the present joint secretary of Delhi Canac Forum Central Delhi. Her special interests include ops, infertility, laparoscopic surgery, and cosmetic gynecology. So over to you, Madam. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Vishal. Uh, good afternoon, respected seniors and my dear colleagues. On behalf of all the members of DGF Central, I welcome you all to this uh, live webinar on fetal surveillance. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. The beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. The more you read and discuss, the more you will learn. I thank Dr. Sharda Jain, ma'am, for giving us all this platform of Delhi Gaini Forum, where we can all interact and share our knowledge. Also, thank you, ma'am, for joining us today. Ma'am needs no introduction. She is a great teacher, surgeon, who has taught for over two decades in medical colleges like PGI Chandigarh and Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi. She's the ethical committee member of Medical Council of India and was given the Teacher of the Teachers Award by the Delhi uh, Gaini Forum in 2018. She has re received many Lifetime Achievement Awards and she is also the Founder Chairman of uh, Pushpanjali Crossley Hospital, which is now Max Veshali. She is the Founder and Director of Life Care Centre in IVF, which is serving East Delhi for last 27 years for Gaini Care, IVF, Bariatric Surgery, Advanced Laparoscopic and Hysteroscopic Surgery. She is the founder and secretary general of Delhi Gynecologist Forum, which was founded in 2000. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today. And I would uh, request you to say a few words of wisdom for all of us. At outset, my request to you is that, you know, every time you introduce me, just give my name. There's no point, you know, wasting two minutes time of yours for this. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I can see, you know, this particular chapter always fascinates me. Uh, till now, we had been talking, uh, saving the lives of the mother. And now we are very strongly, for the last uh, 10, 15 years, we have started talking, uh, saving the lives of the fetus as well. Uh, the time I was trained, you know, and I got my MD, that was 73, 50% deliveries were taking place at home. We've come a long way. It was not surprising at that particular time, you know, the home deliveries, people had problems, but you know, uh, institutional deliveries, uh, the today's uh, specialist, uh, look back uh, to the gurus, you do not have anything, but I think they had a great sense uh, of taking care. And the emphasis that time was on a clinical examination. At that particular time, the antenatal uh, monitoring as for the fetus was concerned, it was indirectly uh, where the weight was, again was okay, where the height uh, of the uterus was okay, the girth was all right, and the you know the fetal heart sound. Uh, till now, in the time when we I got trained, you know, we were used, still using a, a stethoscope and the small things uh, fit over a period of time. Things of that particular thing, that small six inches thing has disappeared. You can't even find in the labor rooms. 
So we have traveled a long, long way. Uh, I remember it uh, uh, that during my uh, late MD time, we found uh, this Delhi fetal movement count had come uh, in a big way. And then, then the, when we were faculty, uh, all this uh, NST, this ESK and everything came, biophysical profile. Uh, when I was, I, I delivered, there was no ultrasound at that time. I never had a single ultrasound. So we have come, uh, we have seen, you know, the sea change as far as uh, the um, obstetricians uh, armamentarium have changed. Uh, what I find that, you know, gynecologists have really put a hard work and as for the maternal mortality is concerned, we are in three figures and we have to compare with our uh, small neighboring country, Sri Lanka, which was at the beginning of the 21st century itself was uh, 30 and we are today 100. So leave aside that. I think, you know, in perinatal mortality or morbidity figures also, we have come down a long way, but still uh, uh, the millennium development goal, we could not reach that kind of figures. What I want, you know, yesterday also in a telemedicine, there was a discussion about it. People are not clear. One thing is clear that, you know, good percentage of patients are high-risk patients. And if you find there's an impossibility of this particular ba uh, baby being lost, there's a one high-risk factor. When should the antenatal fetal monitoring should start? And to my mind, in my clinic, we started at 32 weeks. But patient has got multiple factors. Like she has got a problem of hypertension, she has got diabetes, you know, more than one risk factors are there. Then we start even early at 28 weeks. I think this particular point should be need to be emphasized by uh, Professor Gujral uh, today that at what time the monitoring should start and what is minimum expected. Now litigations are going against the doctors in, uh, I find uh, from Delhi Medical Council, it has come to National Medical Council. If a single baby is lost, till five years back, it was one crore suing. And now it is five to 10 crores. I wish to tell you that anybody who is pro, uh, be a baby who's uh, growth retarded, growth retarded fetus, you, we need Doppler for us to know that how the child is going to take a, to, uh, uh, behave in labor. And in case if you've not done that kind of a thing, then in that particular case, you moment you start uh, the induction, you find soon after the baby gives uh, goes away without giving any signal. Doctor, sab kuch tha. But I think this is what the, what I want Dr. Uh, Kamal Gujral to do it. I am not telling that you do Doppler in every patient, but in growth retarded fetus, it is required. In RH patient, it is required. In rest of the cases, the Doppler is not needed. The routine things can go up. I think I find still, I find daily fetal movement count and the NST is great. But Doppler is needed whenever you have a fetal, a fetal growth retardation. And this particular part need to be emphasized. We make a mistake of inducing these patients and we lose the baby. And we lose the baby, litigation is bound to come. So I think with this particular remark, I want you know uh, things need to be emphasized both by Dr. Gujral and uh, you know great guru uh, like uh, Dr. Renu Mishra who have been talking on this particular subject for a very long time. And I think, you know, you should take it as a mission mode that everybody should become serious. It is time that in their clinics, they must have small CTP machine and everybody should know the interpretation. So this with this remarks, I think, thank you very much. Great going as far as this session is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Um, a very hearty welcome to Padmashri, Dr. Malvika Sabarwal, ma'am. Dr. Malvika Sabarwal, ma'am, is the president of Delhi Gynae Forum Central. She's the chief of the Department of Gynae and OBS in Jeevan Mala Hospital and Apollo Spectra Hospital. She's the founder chairperson of Delhi State uh, IAGE and uh, past <laughs> president of Delhi Gynae Endoscopist Society. She has been invited as faculty in many national and international conferences and has uh, been operating as faculty in many national workshops and has been organizing chairpersons for various conferences. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us today. I would uh, like you to say a few words for us and uh, 
before we start the webinar. Thank you so much for those kind words, Ramni. That was very nice. And as always, Madam Shada, you and I mean, it's really nice that uh, we all realize the importance of antenatal and intrapartum fetal surveillance. Because all of us are practicing obstetricians and we definitely want the perinatal mortality to go down. So if you have good antenatal surveillance, you're looking at a, you know, as a result, your stillbirth should go down. The rate of stillbirth must go, must go down because you, like Madam also mentioned earlier, we will be picking up hypoxia, we'll be timely picking up any kind of asphyxia and intervening as and when required, especially in high-risk pregnancies. We all fall back on kick count, your amount of LICA, that is AFI, what we keep doing, your biophysical scoring or a modified biophysical scoring, or when to do Dopplers. So these are studies which we all, at every time in our practice, we need to reiterate. And Madam Gujral is the best person to be highlighting those things as to when, how frequently, how to start and how to proceed and when to intervene so that the outcome is good. Talking of labor, now labor is a risk time and a stressful time for the fetus. Most of these come out very healthily and nicely crying, but even 1% or 0.1% loss of whatsoever kind, like Madam Sharda pointed out, that it can be a huge medical legal problem to the practicing gynecologist or the obstetrician. So we all fall back on CTG or the continuous uh, uh, the cardiotocography, which we are monitoring the patients with. Now, not only that little, the, the thing would be also of use in a medical legal court because that is your evidence that you have been monitoring. And this is what the trace was. The most important thing here is how to interpret that. So we have the best team led by Dr. Renu Mishra, Rinko, <coughs> the very eminent panelists who are going to give us the beautiful situations wherein we will learn always as always how to interpret it better so that we don't land up doing extra cesareans, but we should definitely timely intervene as and when required. So this important webinar, I will not hold back from. We can just straight go ahead, Rami. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to our first session of antenatal surveillance, I would like to invite the chairperson, Dr. Harsha Kula, ma'am, who is uh, the uh, senior so, consultant in the Institute of Obs and Gyne in uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, she has special interest in oncology. Uh, welcome, Dr. Harsha Kula, ma'am. And our second uh, chairperson is uh, Dr. Abha Sood, ma'am, who is the HOD of the Department of Obs and Gyne and IVF in Jaipur Golden Hospital in Rohini, New Delhi. And she has been... Uh, in practice since more than 35 years. I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, now I request Dr. Abha Sooth to please introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Kaval Gujral. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramnik. Uh, Professor Dr. Kaval Gujral, at present, HOD and Chairperson, Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, is a renowned clinician, academician, and in depth knowledgeable person. She has many laurels and decorations to her credit as shown here and high risk pregnancy is her forte. But this is only proverbial tip of the iceberg. She is much deep in knowledge and its execution which will be evident in the presentation now. So welcome Dr. Gujarat. And introduction, I don't deserve that. Can I have my slides? Yeah, full screen, full screen. Uh, well, a uh, small time for me to talk on such a huge topic. I, I hope I do justice. Now, why do we need an antipartum surveillance? What is the magnitude of fetal problems? Fetal death after 20 weeks occurs in 1% of pregnancies. 30% of these antipartum deaths are due to asphyxia, 30% uh, due to maternal complication, 50% due to congenital malformation and chromosomal abnormalities, and 5% due to infections. 20% of the still births have no cause. 50% of the first trimester spontaneous abortion and 5% of stillborns have chromosome anomalies. Therefore, the surveillance starts right when the patient is tested pregnancy positive. 
and the components would involve determining the gestation age, six components, screening for aneuploidies, screening for preeclampsia, extremely important, detection of congenital malformation, monitoring of fetal growth, and lastly, detection of severity of acute or chronic fetal hypoxia. Now, coming to uh, uh, gestational age determination, we know known LMP, regular cycles, no OCP, uterine size, UPT positive. I'm not going to waste time on that. This is a slide just for the postgrad, what are accident, good and poor dates. So if you have, uh, nowadays, I don't think dating of pregnancy is difficult. Most of the women, when they miss the period, they would test the urinary pregnancy test, take it as 28 days of the cycle, they are positive. Ultrasound, round run in first semester, plus minus five days, mid semester biometry, plus minus seven days. IVF pregnancies, uh, 14 days prior to the oocyte retrieval is the LMP. And in case of donor, you take as uh, embryo transfer. If ultrasound dating and clinical dating are more than one week of each other, you take ultrasound date as correct. Repeat ultrasound after two, three weeks, and adequate growth establishes the ultrasound date, and that is the final date we must mention on our cards. Yeah, that's a good thing. Now, aneuploidy screening, Down syndrome is one in 800 general incidence, one in 250 at uh, 35, and as the age increases, the incidence rises. We have come a long way from the first test started called as a triple test which has the age, AFP, beta, SCG, and estriol. And we have moved on to the quad next, which added inhibin. And now we are at first semester looking at maternal age, nuclear transparency, measles bone, free beta, SCG, papric, commonly known as a dual test with MT. Now, how do we do these tests in clinical practice is by three methods, uh, integrated screen, stepwise, contingent, I'll come to that. And the recent arrival is non-invasive prenatal testing, testing of the fetal chromosome, from eight weeks onwards in maternal blood, an absolutely non-invasive method. Now, this was the integrated screen started in 80s, where they said, do the first trimester screen, don't tell the results of the patient, do the second trimester quad. If both combined risk is more than 250, do an amnio, otherwise she can go through a normal ultrasound. Now, this was criticized because unethical anxiety, how can you withhold the result from a patient? Then came the stepwise screening, uh, where the first semester screen was done, one in 50, which was high risk, they were asked to take a CVS because they're likely to be aneuploids, and the rest went through a second semester cohort test. Again, majority of the women had to wait for the uh, final result, and this was also not accepted. That is why this is the currently accepted model called as a contingent screen. We at Gangaram have been following this for the last 15, 20 years. What we do is that we do the first semester PAPA, beta, SCG, and TNB. If the risk is one in 50, it's high risk. We take it over completely CVS immediately. If the risk is one in 1500, and some take this one in 1000, this is a normal fetus. Go, go just for a second trimester ultrasound. And the intermediate risk between one in 50 and one in 1500 go, went through earlier on a second trimester quad test. If both the combined screens are positive, they went through amnio. If negative, they went no further test. Now, with the arrival of NIPT, this has been a change that if your first semester screen is positive, one in 50, go ahead and do a CVS. If it is negative, low risk, one in 1500, don't do anything, second semester in omni scan. If between 150 and 150, add on NIPT. Positive means testing, negative means no further test. Hence, the pyramid has inversed, as we keep on talking always. We have completed this screen in first semester. Every patient is constant. Now, generally, when you do a mass uh, you know, testing, only about 5% are going to fall in the high risk. And 80, 85% are low risk. 15 to 20% are the intermediate risk between 150, 150 to 1500. So you have reduced the burden on NIPT after utilizing the first semester screen tests. Now, this is just the slide to show you 5% false positive rate detection rate, as you can see in red. The first semester combined stream it has the highest ejection rate amongst the other blood tests, 80 to 82%. And non-invasive prenatal testing has a 99% accuracy, less than 1% false positive result. So commonly asked question, then why not do it for all? Why not? Because, why? Because it is very expensive, one. And secondly, you lose the uh, advantage of a nuchal scan, a first semester anomaly scan, and low pathway, etc. So you screen the women who need to be doing NIPS. 
This is the way we look at it. Now, when not to do in NIP, it is very important to know if the woman has got recurrent miscarriages, she has got a family of genetic disease, ultrasound showing malformation, induced nuchal translucency or nuchal fluid, she's bound to have many more abnormalities just rather than just aneuploidies. There could be deletions, etc. So she needs a complete chromosomal analysis by microarray or any method you use. This slide is important to remember not to order NIPT for all. Now, screening for preeclampsia is the second part in first trimester. Why do we need to screen? Incidence is 2 to 8%, 1 in 5 maternal death, 4-fold increase in perinatal mortality, morbidity, 2 to 4-fold increase of future cardiovascular risk to the mother. And ASPRI trial has shown that 150 milligram for aspirin from 14 weeks onward, onwards for a woman who is at high risk reduces preterm preeclampsia by 78% and reduces term preeclampsia by 62%. So this is an integral part of a fetal surveillance today. So what do we do? Now, NICE guidelines said, look at the high risk factors. I'm not going to read them all. ACOG also said, look at the high risk factor. And those who fall in this high risk, they are the ones to be starting on aspirin. But when you look at the ACOG, there's nulliparity. That means majority of our women are going to have aspirin, which is not right. So Fetal Medicine Foundation looked at maternal factors, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery, mean uterine PI, placental PIGF, and PAP-A. And a cut of one in 100 put the woman at risk, and that's the time which would give aspirin prophylaxis. Now, this is an online calculator chart. You just have to feed the data available on the net of your patient's characteristic, and they will tell you what is your risk, and then uh, pick up the woman who need aspirin prophylaxis. Now, just to tell you that uh, once you say detection rate, by if you look at only the nice 40%, if you uh, and as the uh, factors are going to be adding more and more markers are going to be added, the detection rate rates improve. Now, this slide just to tell you the best rates are maternal factors, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery, PAP A, PIGF, what is given by Fetal Medicine Foundation. Addition of PAP A, uh, the two yellow, they are same. So if PAP A is not added, it doesn't make a difference. If you don't have PIGF, use PAP A and the rest of the factor. If you don't have PAP A, then just use the uterine artery and the maternal factors, MAP, still you will get some kind of an accuracy. Now, uh, detection of congenital anomalies is the next part of the surplus. What is the goal? Identify the lethal ones and terminate. Term treatment in utero, the shunts, the transfusions, etc. Plan delivery at an optimal time mode. Consult, prepare the patient fa family for outcomes. The goal today is to detect major anomalies, major ones, lethal ones in first trimester. But it is not realistic that all anomalies can be detected at first trimester. You have to go at an 18-week scan to be absolutely sure of the anomalies. So when your ultrasonologist or fetal medicine specialist reports what should be seen in an anomaly scan, gestational age, fetal heart rate, placenta, cervix, NT, NB, intracranial translucency, ductus venosus, and TR sometimes. This is a must. Can be seen pre pre maxillary triangle, three vessel cord, CNS, choroid, spine, limb, stomach, urinary bladder, kidneys, orbits, four chamber view, anterior abdominal wall. See, majority of the defects today inverting the pyramid at least can be detected on the first trimester. At least a suspicion can be raised and for a confirmation for at an early anomaly scan, maybe even at 60. Now, when you come to a mid-trimester anomaly scan, incidence of anomalies is 5 to 7%, 2% are major, rest are minor. Accuracy of the scan is up to 90 to 90%. And most visible anomalies can be seen by 20 weeks of menstruation age. Countries where pregnancy termination is restricted, like as it was, should balance between doing the testing for anomalies, doing the invasive testing, and giving it from opinion. It's also important to remember that all anomalies, some anomalies may evolve in third trimester. What are they? Bowel obstructions, urinary bladder obstruction, ventricular megaly. So it is not that if a third trimester picks up an anomaly, it has been missed. It may have just occurred in the third trimester. That is how you got to counsel your patients. Now, so in a mid trimester scan, cardiac activity, fetal number, coronicity for multiples, fetal age, size, and basic anatomy from head to toe till the digit count, everything must be reported. Placental appearance and location, very important today in the rising previous cesarean section report, and of course, cervical length for prevention of preterm birth. 
Now, when should we order fetal echo? It is not mandatory for us that we do echo for all. Unsatisfactory cardiac screen. So what is a satisfactory cardiac screen? Four chamber view, outflow tract, three vessel view, three vessel tracheal view. If the ultrasonologist has reported all 90, 95% of the cardiac defects are there, the rest are minor, you, you can do away with the echo. If you have an abnormal cardiac finding on the ultrasound, you have an abnormal extracardiac finding, you have arrhythmia, increased nuclear translucency, twins, IVF conceived, monochorionic, TTS, hydrops fetalis, certain maternal diseases which put the child at risk of uh, uh, congenital heart defects. Woman has a previous child with congenital heart or she herself had a congenital heart. These are the definite indications for ECHO. Should be done for a pediatric ECHO specialist. That is what I want to emphasize. Now, coming to the a component of determination of fetal growth, such a simple test. You know, I don't know which year it was given, 20 weeks, 20 centimeter, one centimeter per week, but put your hand on your hearts. How many of us have kept an inch tape in our clinics and are measuring as a routine or synthesis from the light? Dr. Sharda Jan said growth. This is the first step to pick up the growth. So if you are not doing it, please let's, uh, we always teach our students when we take an exam, they have to go with the tape, but Many of us don't keep it in tape in our clinics to measure the synthesis bundle height. I'm not going into details how to measure. Normograms are available, 95th, 50th, 10th centile. You can plot them if the growth is falling. You refer below the 10th centile or static growth or it falls below, refer for an ultrasound. Now, important to remember is that sensitivity of picking up a growth is low in this 40, 50%. So growth restriction is the major cause of stillbirth, more than 50% of undiagnosed, uh, you know, you get undiagnosed uh, growth restriction when you do the autopsy. So what should we want to do? One ultrasound between 28 and 30 weeks and one ultrasound preferably at 36 weeks picks up early onset growth restriction, tells you to use Dopplers judicially and also late onset after 34 weeks. I know it is not the norm in practice to recommend three ultrasound, but I don't think there's any harm if you are going to, you know, uh, if you are going to, you are going to pick up a lot of these things. At least I in my practice does one ultrasound after 18 weeks between 28, 30 and one at 36 weeks, even in a low risk pregnancy, call it over. I don't know, but missing the growth restriction does not, uh, is, you know, goes away with that. Now, last segment, test for fetal hypoxia. When should you start testing? Dr. Sharda said uh, 32 weeks, 28 weeks. I think you have to look at survivals in your nurseries and start testing them. If my nursery is comfortable at 27 weeks, 700 gram, I think I should start testing at 26 weeks so that an odd stillbirth I advise. But generally, 28 weeks is the norm today. So the five components of this are daily fetal movement count, non-stress test, biophysical, modified, and doctor, let's come to them. Now, this slide was just to say that fetal movements start at seven weeks, and as the fetus mature, they become more organized, they get a diagonal variation. And look at the average number of movements, 220 weeks, and can be as uh, uh, 282 at 40 weeks, average is 50 to 950, and can be as low as four to 10 in 12 hours. Less fetal activity seen growth statistics, CNS malformations, etc. So now, how do we count? This is a common thing. We practically are doing ten movements in twelve hours, nine a.m., nine p.m. Once she has counted good twelve, uh, ten movements, she can sleep peacefully. Nothing, no harm is going to happen. Various authors have given various movement kick count chart, but I think in practice, uh, uh, these are the count to ten or. If the woman is busy, she's working, she cannot count, then three one hourly, post breakfast, post lunch, post dinner, three one hourly moment, three to four in one hour makes it 10 to 12, that's all. When you look at the data, loss of fetal movements are commonly followed by disappearance of fetal heart in the next 24 hours. So there is the margin. Most of the women will have less movements if they report within 12 hours or so, within 24 hours are not going to have a stillbirth. So I uh, go with Dr. Sharda that this is the most practical uh, thing to counsel our patients. And change in the quality, quantity of movements also be told to the patient. Now, again, most commonly used tests, the non-stress test, physiological basis is that non-hypoxic, non-neurological depressed fetus responds to a fetal movement by increasing its heart rate, just like when a child, it runs or plays with the ball, the heart rate of childhood increase, which means 
uh, the baby has intact electrical conduction pathway, myocardial hormonal, neurohormonal receptors are appropriate, sympathetic parasympathetic reflexes acting in coordination, and myocardium is normal, not a disease. This is the most frequently used fetal subnestate. It is simple, non-invasive, ease of performance, uh, and availability. Now, this is a reactive NST. We don't have to go on detail. Normal heart, normal variability, two acceleration, 15 beats, 15 minutes, preterm fetal, 10 beats, 10 minutes. This is called a reactive NST. But what is the problem? Anything which does not fit in this criteria is called as non-reactive, which could be abscess or inadequate number of acceleration, or tachycardia, or bradycardia, low variability, or even a spontaneous deceleration. And uh, there are certain factors, fetal maturation, preterm fetus, less acceleration, 10 beats, 10 seconds, sleep cycle of the baby, there's going to be low variability, fed state, in maternal fed state, glycemia, inconsistent effect, some medications slow the heart, decrease the variability, some increase it, you stimulate the fetus, fetus would move and perhaps will resist an acceleration, change of position only if it's in a supine, it's a big baby and the aortocoval compression is there, otherwise it doesn't make a difference. So now, if the hypoxia is acute, there's decrease in the fetal movements and there's been no acceleration. But if you carefully look at repeated NSTs of your patient, chronic hypoxemia, gradual decrease in acceleration, gradual decrease in movements, decoupling of acceleration with fetal movements, disappearance of both acceleration and fetal movements, and then loss of variability and deceleration. This is how chronically, if you follow a patient, you can proceed on that. Now, what is the validity in the clinical practice? Reactive NST, perinatal mortality, 2.3 per thousand within one week of no testing, very low chance of adverse outcome. You can safely repeat in one, but 50% of the tests are false, uh, false non-reactive tests. You extend it to 41, 20 minutes, they reduce to 25%. You add vibroacoustic stimulation, it reduces to 2%. But if after all this, the test is non-reactive, as we subsequently see, uh, it is an advanced stage of stress, it needs uh, advanced stage of hypoxia, it needs a backup test, a truly non-reactive NST reflects an advanced stage of fetal distress. So, bias we know artificial fetal larynx giving 80 hertz sound, fetus wakes up with a starter response, registers an acceleration. You apply it three times for three seconds, there'll be an acceleration. There was one paper in saying that halogen light stimulation also, uh, you know, wakes up the baby, but we never used it. Now, because 50% of the tests were false, non reactive, and added anxiety, SOC came up with this guideline to make another group call as atypical NST. There's a normal NST, abnormal NST, like the previous one. In between, they have given features which is atypical. Atypical needs a re repeat, abnormal needs an urgent action, normal re needs repeat testing one week. All the books have this, not reading all the details. Now, newer modification, computerized C uh, CTG, which we don't have. This is very nicely predictive of fetal distress, short-term variation, uh, et cetera, are, have a strong correlation with SED. Now, biophysical profile is a testing modality to evaluate the probability of the given fetus having or not having sufficient liver oxygen to select primary or secondary target organs so as to maintain normal function. So what does this mean? That when there's a fetal hypoxemia, there's a CNS dysfunction. Every variable of the fetus is controlled by a particular area of the brain. The cortex is controlled by the, the tone is controlled by cortex, breathing is at the ventral surface of the fourth ventricle, movements are by cortex and NST by midbrain. Mid -brain. So if oxygen supply to any one of this area gets affected, decrease, the variable controlled by that area gets affected and is represented as zero or not okay on a biophysical. The oxygen supply gets okay, the variable becomes normal. So frequently you'll have a BPS of six by 10 in the morning after a couple of hours, it's all normal. If the hypoxemia continues, there's a redistribution of more blood to the brain, adrenals, heart, less to the kidney and hence less liker. That is a chronic and chronic depictor of biophysical score. It's a marker of acute and chronic both. That is the advantage. So this is how uh, you uh, interpret uh, amniotic fluid, the chronic one, NST, fetal tone, gross body movement, breathing movement, two for all. There's no one and zero if they are not adequate. Now, <clears throat> 
if the biophysical is 10, it's a very important slide, 10 on 10 biophysical and 8 on 10, but amniotic fluid is normal, the pain at loss is 1 per 1,000, with NST it was 2.3 per 1,000. If it is 8 by 10, score may be the same, but uh, the fluid is abnormal, the minus 2 is for abnormal fluid, low liquor, then the, it rises to 89 per 1,000. 6 on 10, normal fluid variable, 6 on 10, abnormal fluid, again 89 per 1,000, which means to say that amniotic fluid is an extremely important component of uh, biophysical score because it depicts chronic hypoxia. But at a zero of biophysical score, 6 on 10, 10 babies will die, 4 will be still alive. So to determine the amniotic fluid, uh, four quadrant assessment, dividing it, some total longitudinal was called as the amniotic fluid index. And these are the values, 8 to 18 normal, less than 5 and less is the so-called oligo. Low is between 5.1 and 8, more than 18 high. Now, maximum vertical pocket has become recently more popular. Normal is more than two centimeter, oligo is less than one centimeter, because if you compare the MVP with amniotic fluid index, amniotic fluid index over predicts oligo amnios, you know, increases surveillance. Therefore, this, and when you see a low amniotic fluid index, please look at the maximum vertical pocket. And if that is okay, you can still hold on. If both are not okay, then, then you need to take an action. Multiple, especially, you need to uh, monitor on a maximum vertical pocket. So, uh, because these two components were important, the NST and the uh, uh, amniotic fluid, so modified biophysical score came that you do an NST, and if uh, by 10 minutes the accelerations have happened, you do either a maximum vertical pocket or do a four quarter assessment. And how do you react? NST reactive, AFI normal or less than five, need to repeat in three days' time. Both are non-reactive need delivery, non-reactive NST, but amniotic fluid normal. That is a time you use a full biophysical score. So you can decrease the load on your ultrasound department by doing the modified. You do the NST, send it for a minute to the ultrasound to determine the amniotic fluid. If it is this, then only you do a full, full biophysical score. Now, coming to the last segment of Doppler velocity metry, this is a very important and today, it has become the primary method of fetal surveillance. It is based on the premise that insufficient uterine, placental, or fetal circulation results in, in, in an adverse pregnancy outcome. And today, the technology can map all these circulations. Uterine, the maternal, umbilical, the placental, middle cerebral artery, the fetal, descending uterine, renal venous circulation, all fetus. Now, let's see in clinical practice. And whenever you measure, you measure the systolic, diastolic, calculate the indices. In practice, it is PI, which is most accurate for, uh, you know, outcomes. Now, uterine artery Doppler is the first vessel to show a change as the trophoblast sets in the end of the first trimester and then the second trimester, the uterine vessel dilate, diastolic blood flow increases and the uterine PIs fall. The normal ratios are written on the slide. So this is the first test, as we said earlier, in first semester, mean PI, more than 95th centile, can predict that this is either the setting of preeclampsia and or as FGR associated with, uh, with the preeclampsia. And if it carries on through second semester, you know, 95th centile above, the outcomes are not going to be very, the outcomes are going to be suffering. And if it carries on to the third trimester, still there is a higher chance of stillbirths, et cetera. If the uterine artery is uh, normal in first semester, becomes abnormal later, again, be on vigilant, abnormal in the first semester and becomes normal, be little happy. Now, these were just the vessels. Now, umbilical artery Doppler, because obviously the blood flow is increasing throughout diastole till 40 weeks, it will go on increasing. So, PIRISD will fall. PI of one is taken at 30 weeks. And today it's very easy that ultrasound uh, machines have set in values that. 10th, 50th, and 90th percentile as per the gestational age. So you just have to write your gestational age. The graph will show you where your umbilical artery doctor falls. Once it is above the 95th percentile, you be on the guard. Otherwise, you can be happy. Now, uh, this is just to see how you take it, that you should take it at the fetal side because values are different. And 30% of the placenta, when it's affected, 
it is uh, it is only depicted in Doppler studies when 60 to 70 percent of placenta is affected it results in absent and diastolic and reverse and diastolic so when you get a 90 percentile value above you say 30 percent of placenta circulation is already affected beyond the guard so that it doesn't go in absent and reverse flow not just the pictures now middle cerebral artery uh, in a normally growing fetus, the flow through diastole increases throughout, but at any point of gestational age, the values of PI of middle cerebral artery are higher than the umbilical artery. Therefore, blindly, the cerebroplacental index is always more than one at any given gestational age for a cross look. Otherwise, middle cerebral artery PIs are again centiles are given a value less than fifth centile means the cerebral vessel is dilated, hypoxia has set in, and these norms we can look at. I'll just come to it later. data. Now, venous circulation, ductus venosus, most commonly matched, a triphasic pattern, A wave, and then reversal are the ones which tell you the last stage of fetal distress. So as a clinician, what we find is that uterine artery has the earliest change to set in right from the first semester, then the growth, watch out, then the umbilical artery, then the middle cerebral artery, then amniotic fluid, then FR, FR changes. Now, this is a slide to just to show you that in a growth restricted fetus, what is the first sign? AC lag because umbilical venous volume is reduced, liver size is reduced, we don't measure that. So AC is the first one, which abdominal circumference, which is the first biometric sign of fetal growth restriction, then raise umbilical artery Doppler, then flow redistribu redistribution, more blood to the brain. So MCA becomes dilated, less blood to the kidneys, amniotic fluid uh, index or the maximum vertical pocket falls, then absent and diastolic in the umbilical artery. There may be less movements, less variability, not certain. And then reverse flow in the umbilical artery, then MCA may normalize, then the ductus venosus, A wave absent, then reversal. And lastly, the biophysical uh, score or the non-reactive and late desolation. So it's an advanced stage of fetal distress when the biophysical and non-reactive NST would happen and finally fetal circulatory collapse in death. Now this hierarchy of changes is usually maintained and uh, as a clinician we normally get a woman with a raised umbilical artery uh, and diastolic a mildly reduced AFI. It is present in diagnosis. Early changes will come two to three weeks before a non-reactive uh, FHR, that is AED, absent and diastolic, and MCA dilated. Late changes six days before the non-reactive, that is a reverse flow and increased resistance in ductus. Very late changes 72 hours before a BPS decline, that is reverse flow in ductus and pulsatile flow in umbilical vein. So based on all these studies, as we said, today we should do a state-based management of fetal growth restriction and do delivery and monitoring as per the guidelines set in the norm. Once we follow this, if an odd stillbirth happens, we have gone by the protocol, we'll be saved in the court of law. Stage one, small baby, mild placental insufficiency. Uh, you'll have abnormal uterine artery, abnormal umbilical artery, MCA, CPR. You should weekly monitor and deliver beyond 37 weeks. Stage two, fetal growth restriction, severe insufficiency, absent and diastolic. Bi-weekly monitoring, deliver at 34 weeks and beyond. Stage 3, uh, advanced fetal deterioration, but still there is no acidosis. Reverse flow in uh, umbilical artery, ductus above 90 percentile, centile, daily or alternate monitoring, deliver at 30, 32 weeks. Stage 4, this is an acidotic fetus. You'll have deceleration, reduced variability on CCTG, reverse flow in ductus. You have to monitor 12, 24 hours. Give a course of stellar, deliver as soon as possible, depending on the gestational age in your NICU, at which you can assure a survival to patient that yes, this baby has got 80% chances of survival. So if I have to conclude, it was a vast topic. I hope I've done some justice to it. I can only say that no single antipartum surveillance technique suffices in testing all elements of fetal growth maturity, nutrition, oxygenation, and neurological function. A battery of tests can suggest that these milestones have reached so as when to intervene so as to prevent a fetal death and damage. With that, a big thank you to the organizers. Thank you, Dr. Gujral.
for beautifully discussing about the problems which can be faced right from the early pregnancy till delivery. And these can be detected by monitoring starting from the first semester onwards. You rightly said that dating is very, very important because if dating is incorrect, then you may confuse it with the fetal growth restriction also. So I think that also should come in this thing, uh, antenatal fetal surveillance only. And secondly, that of course, it's very important to rule out there is no aneuploidy, there is no congenital malformation, as you rightly said, that there are certain abnormalities which can appear during the third trimester of pregnancy also. So that is why a third trimester scan is also very, very important. And of course, for the aneuploidy screening, you have beautifully told about the integrated, sequential and the contingent screening, which of course we are following in our hospital. Then, of course, preeclampsia screening, then when to start the aspirin in at all, then ultrasound, when to do the fetal echo. So you have nicely touched very practical points useful for the PGs and the practitioners. So in this era of the litigation, it is very, very important to use the tests necessary for the particular patient. Thank you, Dr. Gujral, once again. And I congratulate you for beautifully discussing in a very, very simplified way. And I think we have understood very well. Thank you so much, Dr. Gujral. Harsh is the first time you call me, Dr. Gujral. Thank you. <laughs> She's called me, Dr. Gujral, for the first time. Yes, We've been so friends for 30 our... years. And look at her being <laughs> very <laughs> polished, calling me doctor. <laughs> she will always say, come on, very bad soon. So... <laughs> So over to you, Ramli, please. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for a very, very enlightening session. So really excellent. Second... You know, Dr. Gujral, that was really excellent. I just had to. And she has explained this... a very simplified way. Yes, beautiful, Malika, beautiful. Huh? So we move on without wasting time. We have lots in store now. Yes, ma'am. So you. our second session, ma'am, our second session is a panel discussion on intrapartum surveillance. I would like to invite upon the moderators, uh, Dr. Renu Mishra and Dr. Rinku Sen Gupta. Dr. Renu Mishra is a senior consultant, uh, OBS and Gaini, and head of the IVF in uh, Sitaram Bharatiya Institute of Science and Research, New Delhi. And ma'am's special area of interest is endoscopic surgery, infertility, and IVF. I welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Rinku Sen Gupta Dhar is a senior consultant in OBS and Gaini in Sitaram Bharatiya Institute of Science and Research. And her special interests are in improving quality of maternity care with special focus on reducing interventions. And uh, she's a co investigator in several maternity care related ICMR projects. The panelists are Dr. Divya Singhal. Dr. Divya Singhal has a special interest in high-risk pregnancy, infertility, and prevention of uh, CA cervix. Next panelist is Dr. Dipti Nav. She's the director of Mother and Child Center and a senior visiting consultant at Max Hospital, Patparganj and Vaishali. And she's the secretary of the Delhi Gaini Forum East. Ma'am's area of expertise is infertility, high-risk pregnancy, and menopause. Dr. Manju Khemani is the Senior Director, Department of OBS and Gynae in Max uh, Smart Super Speciality Hospital, New Delhi. Ma'am is an ex-professor uh, in Lady E. Harding Medical College, New Delhi, and she's a member of the Endoscopic Committee of AOGD. Dr. Shashi Kabra Maheshwari is the Senior Specialist OBS and Gynae in Analaksha Nodal Officer. Uh, Ma'am is an NBE faculty and resource person and recipient of Wonder Foxy Award 2019. I welcome all the panelists and the moderators. And uh, with this, we would start the session of intrapartum surveillance. Can I share my screen? Thank you very much, Dr. Amni. Um, at the outset, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Sharda Jain, ma'am, for including me on this platform and to my dear Malvika for letting me speak on what I love to speak on. So CTG has been a very old passion 
In fact, I wrote a book when I was in Abu, Abu Dhabi for a couple of years because uh, in Ames, we used to take like 10 minutes, 15 minutes trips because we didn't want to run out of paper. And there, you know, it was kilometers or miles and miles of CTG flowing out. And I thought, you know, it's a shame, you know, such rich treasure should be used for teaching and training. But to be honest, my interest in CTG started way back when I was a junior resident and the CTG machine had just made an appearance in the labor ward that was in the early 80s. And uh, though I didn't know much myself about CTG, but I was disappointed to see that even low risk women, they, they had one big deceleration and they went to the OT. Knowing fully well that if they were not hooked onto the CTG, probably they would have delivered vaginally without any problem. So, well, you can't blame the CTG for it because uh, we didn't, most people didn't understand the electrophysiology, the interpretation, the limitations. But we have come a long way uh, since it's four decades now, and we do understand it much better. We do understand the limitations. Um, but for this reason, we must have a continuous training for our nurses and our doctors because it's something you have to sort of update yourself day in and out because we are taking decisions on a daily basis. And uh, we also need to understand that though, I mean, with all the uh, limitations of CTG, it is also true that we don't have a better tool as of now to monitor the fetal well-being in utero. So like it or not, you can't do away with CTG. You need to use CTG, but we must use it judiciously as an ancillary to our clinical judgment and not as a replacement. So with these words, um, I am going to disappoint a little bit to my panelists that I'm going to speak a little bit uh, on intrapartum surveillance to revise the normal and abnormal fetal heart rate patterns for our younger colleagues, Respect, uh, requesting the senior colleagues to bear with me. Manjudi, please, Maria Gane. I'm going to... <laughs> Dr. Manju was my senior resident when I was junior resident. So I need to take permission. Okay, so... Um, a little bit about intrapartum surveillance. So we know that when we're talking about monitoring, we have to monitor the mother and the baby. But since the focus of today's webinar is saving the fetus, I'm going to be uh, concentrating on the fetus. So the first question is, why do we need to monitor the fetus during labor? We're talking about intrapartum monitoring now. Because we know that when the uterus contracts, temporarily the blood supply to the baby is interrupted. It is of no consequence when we are looking at a healthy, well-grown baby, but a baby which is already on the verge or it has a borderline oxygen reserve like a growth-restricted baby may actually become overtly hypoxic during these contractions. 40 to 60% of stillbirths have hypoxic etiology and also 10% of cases of cerebral palsy are accounted by intrapartum hypoxia. So keeping that in mind, what is the goal of What is the goal of intrapartum monitoring is to try and detect changes in fetal heart rate patterns because that is how we can access the baby. Um, suggestive fetal hypoxia and intervene timely so that we can prevent morbidity because of hypoxia or fetal death. But at the same time, we need to remember that the, the obstetric interventions should not go unrealistically high, like I said, you know, just on some CTG patterns. And we also need to understand that there is no fetal surveillance method, as also Dr. Gujral emphasized, which will provide 100% detection of fetal compromise. The methods of fetal, intrapartum fetal monitoring, well, we've got the age-old intermittent auscultation, which is still in, it is not outdated. In fact, it is recommended that low-risk women should still be using, we should be using either a stethoscope or a handheld Doppler, and we should auscultate at the end of contraction. And in high risk, if you do have a CTG, then we should be, it is preferred that we use electronic fetal monitoring because you can get a trace and it which you can document if there are any changes. What is more important is that it is not enough just to attach a CTG, but if uh, there's somebody not supervising the CTG, then, then the purpose is defeated. So just as we do the intermittent auscultation, somebody should be looking at the CTG every 15 to 30 minutes in first stage. And every five minutes, or sometimes if there are changes, then after every contraction in second stage. Indications of CTG, I will not go into this detail. I'm sure everybody is aware of this. Any factors in antepartum period which are suggestive of, uh, or where baby may be more prone to develop hypoxia during labor, like growth restriction, 
and bleeding, meconium, hypertension, all these problems or delay in labor would actually uh, warrant that we should go on to continuous CTG monitoring. The components of CTG, there are basically four components, the baseline fetal heart rate, normal is 110 to 160, baseline variability, which is five to 25 accelerations and decelerations. All four components must be evaluated. Presence of acceleration is reassuring. However, if the accelerations are not there, but otherwise the CTG is normal, there's nothing to worry about. And not all decelerations are necessarily ominous. What can be the abnormal fetal heart rate uh, components or patterns? So you could have either a tacky or a brady or a prolonged deceleration. Prolonged deceleration is anything which lasts three minutes or more. Baseline, you could be having poor variability, less than five beats per minute or more than 25. Uh, we are not so clear about the risk of high variability as we are about low variability. We certainly know that if the variability is poor, it can happen both in acute and in chronic hypoxia. And sinusoidal pattern is a very, very typical pattern which is seen with fetal anemia. Decelerations, of course, we all know we can have late decelerations, variable decelerations, and early decelerations, though early decelerations are not considered abnormal. I think the, the only um, uh, sort of rider to this statement would be that if you are getting early deceleration in first stage when the head is not negotiated, sometimes it may show CPD because the head is trying to negotiate, but because of CPD, the head cannot enter. So, so the baby is like sort of pushing against a wall and you get early deceleration. Early deceleration are usually because of head compression. So tachycardia, you can have maternal and fetal reasons. So maternal in labor, dehydration, common, and uh, fetal, of course, we know prematurity uh, is a common reason. We have the uh, uh, muted, please. Okay. So this is uh, CTG showing fetal tachycardia. You can see that the baseline, if you can appreciate, is somewhere around 170 to 180 here. But I would say this is uncomplicated fetal tachycardia. You can see that the maternal pulse is 118. So it's basically a reflection of the maternal pulse and it is because the mother is having some temperature. But the good thing is that apart from the baseline increase in heart rate, the, it's a nicely variable, good baseline variability, accelerations, no dissolutions. So such um, a pattern is usually not much of worry if patient's dehydrated, give her some fluid. If she's having temperature, give her some paracetamol and you will get back a normal heart rate. This kind of tachycardia is ominous. This was a patient who was 32 weeks pregnant, came with some bleeding and pain abdomen. She was not in labor, uterus was irritable. And on CTG, we could see some unprovoked decelerations. So she was taken for a cesarean. There was placental abruption and baby was saved and baby was fine. So, so, so this is because now you have got abnormal features like poor variability as well as decelerations which are unprovoked. So that makes the tachycardia complicated. Bradycardia or prolonged deceleration, we are generally more worried about bradycardia than tachycardia. You could have it because of several problems uh, with the mother, with posture, vomiting, anything which has vagal stimulation or if there's hypotension which can occur after giving a uh, epidural for analgesia, hyperstimulation if you're giving oxytocin and not monitoring. The fetal uh, end, the most uh, we are worried about mostly whether the baby is hypoxic or having asphyxia. So showing you some uh, patterns of uh, prolonged deceleration, like this one, you see this is almost like one, two, three, four, five minutes. So it is a prolonged deceleration but it is simply because of supine hypotension because as soon as the patient is turned on her left lateral, that's all that is done. And the, the fetal heart rate is nicely variable and comes back to its normal heart rate. This is a CTG um, when patient is vomiting, you can see there is the abdomen is also showing hypertonus, the abdominal belt. Well, this is possible only if you have a fetal scalp electrode because if a patient is vomiting with an abdominal electrode, it will usually move away and not show much recording. So anything which stimulates the vagus can actually cause bradycardia. Prolonged deceleration because of tachycystole. So if you see that contractions here, 
uh, basically there's like a hypertonus because as important as it is to get uterine contractions it is also equally important that there should be a phase where the the uterus um, relaxes completely because that is the time when the fetus is going to get its blood supply so we do need to accelerate uh, contractions to get uh, the cervix opening up but then we we may, must make sure that there is an, an intervening period of relaxation and the baby is well oxygenated so as soon as the usual um, action would be to if she is on syntocinon reduce syntocinon or switch off syntocinon if she is not on oxytocin you could give tubitolin or even if it, after stopping syntocinon if the contractions are more then you could give tubitolin subcutaneous or intravenous to get back the uh, uterine contractions to a more sane sort of status this this patient this was a very sad story this was one of the patients i had in abu dhabi she was a, a previous cesarean section young girl 25 years old and uh, she was she came with my sort of pain abdomen just irritable uterus not in labor and uh, since she was for we back we actually left her she was there in the labor ward more than 24 hours you know just doing intermittent monitoring because we wanted her to go into labor herself but then after 24 hours we thought well she's not the contractions are not increasing let's start some synto and see you know whether she progresses and while we were actually thinking to start synto we had not even started synto Uh, the ctg was just put up so that we will start oxytocin and there was a huge big deceleration in fact the, the the baby's heart rate dropped to 60 70 and it never picked up patients was was literally wheeled into the ot which was next door and the baby was take out, taken out asap but we could not revive the baby there was no abruption there was no rupture there was no cord around neck there was there was nothing to explain uh, why the baby had this bradycardia and baby died poor baseline variability like i said um, you know you can sometimes see it even when the patient comes in early labor in cases where there is chronic hypoxia during active labor if you have phases of poor baseline variability which then pick up and the baseline variability becomes normal then there is not much to it really it's not very significant but if this continues then of course it is important and we need to make sure that the baby is not hypoxic Can yes. I interrupt for a minute here? Yes. Yes. Just on the same point which you are saying. Yeah. So when a patient comes to the labor room and sisters are doing the NST, the moment they see the decreased variability, they start. The trip. But this phase, you know, when there is a decreased variability during labor and then it becomes normal, it's a normal phase that yes. should be emphasized. It does not require any intervention. Absolutely. That is what I am saying. That if the poor, because baby has its sleep wake cycles, baby has this activity, low low activity and high activity. So that also is manifested as baseline variability. So a short span of poor baseline variability followed by a good variability does not have any significant. That we do not need to do anything. No interventions, please. But this patient was very interesting because this was actually not because of hypoxia. this patient had a ctg like this in antepartum she was uh, and then it remained so during the intrapartum period now i i need to let the cat out of the bag because this was already a diagnosed down syndrome but in abu dhabi they would not uh, you know uh, terminate a pregnancy even when downs was diagnosed so we let this patient be without with this ctg she delivered had a normal baby no hypoxia but baby was down in in my almost 30 35 years i have seen two babies with poor baseline variability which turned out to be downs but that's that's a uncommon scenario usually we're thinking of fetal hypoxia this was another interesting patient so this is sinusoidal pattern which we say that the baseline is like a sine wave so it is a very classical typical pattern so this patient was 35 weeks presented with vomiting and epigastric pain and the ctg was like this sinusoidal so patient was induced because we were worried about hypoxia because it sort of continued to be like this and uh, but the ctg remained the same even th this is in early labor the ctg was still the same and then we put her on a computer i ct just to see whether we getting any visor you know is this giving us anything else any other uh, interpretation and if you see this this is the interpretation that was given by the computer it says sinusoid found so uh, having this uh, now diagnosed that it was definitely sinusoidal 
went uh, ahead and we did a cesarean section. She 2.1 kilo baby. Baby had severe fetal anemia, was transfused. Baby was uh, baby had hemolytic disease of newborn with anti E antibodies and had hyperbilirubinemia. This can also occur in FMH or in other kinds of fetal anemia. So coming to variable decelerations, these are the commonest type during labor and usually innocuous. Uh, they are usually because of, mainly because of cord or sometimes because of head, head compression, particularly when you do an ARM or if there is severe oligohydramnios. Um, as long as there are no atypical features, we generally don't worry so much seeing uh, variable decelerations during uh, labor. But if there are atypical features, they may be more indicative or hypoxia, or, the, or we may need to be more vigilant to exclude hypoxia. So atypical features include lasting more than 60 seconds, reduced baseline variability within the deceleration, failure to return to baseline, biphasic shape, and no shouldering. So I will show you some patterns. So this is a typical variable deceleration. We call them variable because they are varying in size, shape, and in and in uh, context to the contractions, they, they are placed in, in different you know, phases of contractions. So these are variable decelerations, but why they, they are typical? Because the baseline variability is good. Even while there is a deceleration, the variability is maintained, the baseline heart rate is maintained, and it is coming up. And also, if you see, this is a shoulder. I will show you another one. Shouldering means that baby compensates very well. This is an atypical uh, variable decelerations where you see that this, the, uh, like I said, one of the features was more than 60 seconds. So this is almost like three minutes or four minutes deceleration. And this patient had cord prolapse and was taken for cesarean and the baby was saved. This was incidentally an admission CTG. Patient was just came in with leaking. And when we put her on CTG, there was CTG, did a PV, there was a cord and patient was wheeled into the OT. This is another atypical feature, which is very ominous, is not to see variability. There is no variability at the baseline. There is no variability while there are deceleration. This is a very ominous CTG, which one would not sit over. Another atypical feature is when it is not, when after the deceleration, they're not returning to baseline. So the baseline is slightly sort of falling after every uh, deceleration. This is showing shouldering which like I said, shouldering means that the baby compensates. There is a drop in the baby's heart rate, but when it goes back to, these, uh, to the uh, baseline heart rate, fetal heart rate, it actually overshoots, which shows that there are compensatory me mechanism working good with this baby. So um, I'm showing you shoulder, but actually atypical feature is when there is no shouldering. So I wanted to show you the shoulder to, to show that when there is no shouldering, that is again, another atypical feature. These are late decelerations. We all know that they occur after the peak of the contraction. These are early decelerations due to head compression and usually in late first stage, second stage, they're of no consequence. Little bit about uh, categorization and then we move on to the panel questions, uh, cases. So this is in the NICE pathway, which says that if you have a normal baseline CTG, all components go through normal care, and if you have acute bradycardia, prolonged deceleration, something which is pathological, then you need to first institute. Well, you, you institute the conservative measure as you're going along, but do fetal scalp stimulation, blood sampling, or expert eye delivery. So normal reassuring patterns, all the four components are normal, strongly predictive of normal acid-base status. So this is a normal CTG in labor, all components good, baseline heart rate normal, accelerations, va variability, no decelerations. Non-reassuring features. So, so there are reassuring features, non-reassuring features, and abnormal features. That's how it's been divided. So, you know, every now in every few years, ACOG or RCOG brings out a new guideline. There are a little bit here and there differences, but basic essence is still the same. So non-reassuring is in, in between normal and abnormal. So baseline, if it is little higher or lower, it becomes non-reassuring. Similarly, if there are variable deceleration or late decelerations, which are happening for, for a short span, like suppose they're happening for 15, 20 minutes, and then they, they are not there, then we, we, we still don't have to really take the patient for cesarean. I mean, they might just get corrected by your uh, intrauterine resuscitation measures. So these are some non-reassuring features and abnormal features, of course, if the baseline is very tacky or very bratty, 
and uh, if the variability continues to be poor after 90 minutes and if variable uh, atypical decelerations or late decelerations continue beyond half an hour or there is acute bradycardia or a single prolonged deceleration that is what we are most scared of that's probably the <laughs> So uh, pathological or abnormal CTG is when you have one abnormal feature or two non-reassuring features. So we've just discussed this review clinical condition, institute intrauterine resuscitation, confirm fetal well-being, and if you're still worried, expedite delivery. So what can we do for resuscitation? The most important is change position to relieve supine hypertension. Turn a left lateral or whatever position she wants to be, but she needs to be moved off her back. The latest guidelines now do not recommend that, like we used to say, give fast fluid to everybody. They say only if there is hypertension, give fluids. Otherwise, it does not do any good. Reduce contraction frequency, like I said, either reduce or stop oxytocin or give tocolytics. And even oxygen uh, uh, to the mother, which we have done for so long, the NICE guideline now say it may harm the baby unless there is hypoxia. Do not give routinely oxygen. I think it's going a little bit too far to say it may harm the baby, but it may not do any good to the baby. So, uh, well, I mean, it, it doesn't do much good. We all have nowadays pulse oximeters. If the SpO2 is low, maybe if you're more sort of, uh, you should be giving her oxygen. And abnormal CT requiring urgent delivery is acute bradycardia or single prolonged deceleration, which continues. So this usually, uh, these are acute events like cord prolapse, rupture uterus, abruption. So we need to expedite delivery. And uh, if your intrauterine resuscitation brings, you know, all these abnormal features back to normal, then of course you can still leave the patient. Otherwise you need to deliver the patient, particularly if this bradycardia persists for nine minutes. Within this time, we must have prepared for delivery. And if she persists, we must take the baby out ASAP. And nowadays we recommend that paired umbilical artery and vein samples should be taken uh, to corroborate whether there was fetal distress and also for medical legal reasons. Best would be to do it in all, but otherwise wherever you think that the baby could be having a poor APGAR, it is a good idea to take do this. So uh, the final slide is that CTG must be inspected every 15 to 30 minutes. Contractions must be documented. That's one thing, you know, most people, a lot of people Actually, even for an intrapartum CTG, do not put the contraction belt or they do not take care of the contraction belt. And then you cannot actually say these are early decelerations or variable deceleration or, or late decelerations. And you simply see, see deceleration and you start getting worried. So we have to have contraction belt. Interpret CTG in the light of clinical situation. Like I said, you cannot just treat a CTG. You have to see the clinical high risk factors. Sometimes you cannot categorize a CTG. So that is what I wanted to say to the panelists also. There's nothing right and wrong. We do this every day, yet we only come to know retrospectively that this decision was right or wrong. So it is very easy to be wise retrospectively. And people will say, Mene na, cesarean kar dena. So that, you know, but, but it is a good idea to take opinion from a colleague, senior, junior, whoever is there, you know, sometimes when you're not able to decide whether the CTG is good, bad, whether it needs active intervention. And do not forget to date and time the CTG with your signature, which makes it a medical legal document. So I would now um, stop sharing this and I will share the CTG cases. Rinku, are you there? Yes, yes, ma'am, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. If you permit, ma'am, I'll just say a quick thank you to the organizers and uh, Sharda, ma'am, who's been my teacher in third year and all my teachers and seniors who are there. Uh, I'm really grateful that, you know, I can participate here and interact with you all. Can we move on to the first case, ma'am? So Dr. Inku would start with the, the first two cases. And these are the panelists and moderator, as we all know by now. So I uh, personally feel that, you know, uh, the anatomy of a CTG is very complicated. And uh, however much we read the guidelines and we, we go through all the different literature, it is, it is sometimes very difficult to say whether a CTG is suspicious or abnormal because most of the CTGs in labor are a combination of different things. 
And uh, rather than talking about CTG anatomically, let us talk about CTG more physiologically and pathologically. You know, uh, like to the panelists also, I will request that whenever I show you a CTG, the first thing you ask yourself is whether, you know, this fetus is fit enough to go through this journey of labor, number one. Number two, is this fetus suffering significant hypoxia? Because some hypoxia, every fetus will suffer, and that is fine. The fetus is, is well equipped to cope with that stress. And if that hypoxia is really significant, do you think it is acute or chronic or, you know, it is ongoing or is it just there and then it goes away? And most importantly, whether this fetus can cope with this hypoxia or is it decompensating? I think these are four things that we have to ask ourselves when we see every CTG. And remember, just looking at a strip will not be enough. We will have to look at the previous CTG to really understand the entire picture properly. So I'll start with Dr. Shashi. So this is a CTG, uh, all the clinical details are there. So ma'am, uh, do you think this uh, baby is fit enough for the labor journey? Hello, Dr. Dr. Kachi, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, so you yeah. think the fetus is fit enough? Yes, uh, in this CTG, what I'm seeing is that, uh, see, we have to focus on the four important points. First is, uh, Baseline rate, then variability, then acceleration, and then deceleration. So if we look at the baseline rate, it is between 140 to 160, almost it is going, and uh, seems to be normal. And uh, then... Right. The you want to, you want to uh, talk about the contractions? How many contractions in 10 yeah. minutes, ma'am? Yeah, there are contractions. Three, three contractions in yeah, 10 minutes? Yes. Yeah, there are three contractions uh, in... Uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, there are three contractions. Yes, ma'am. So do you think anything is uh, missing in this CTG, ma'am? Is there any, any information that you would like to have here? Yeah, I would have there? liked to know two things. One thing is whether this patient had any high risk, why she was subjected to CTG, or there was any problem on intermittent auscultation. And third right. thing was she was given oxytocin augmentation or induction. Right. No, um, right now, whatever is not there, we assume that it wasn't there. Now, uh, your, uh, your question about the admission CTG is very, very relevant. We are doing admission CTGs for all low-risk mothers in the private sector. And of course, even in the government, uh, it, it, I don't think it's possible. It is not logistically possible. But anyway, uh, controversy apart, this particular mother had admission CTG, uh, just like that, maybe not evidence-based. And uh, you are happy with the CTG, but is there anything else you would like? I, I mean, there's one parameter which is missing here, which is the maternal pulse. Yeah, so maternal pulse. Yeah, so every CTG so should have should a maternal be, pulse. Yeah, they should have, because sometimes it may record maternal pulse. Yes. So yes. we have to be very careful. Yes, ma'am. So moving on, uh, ma'am, next slide, please, Dr. Inu. So... Uh, after I think uh, maybe six hours or so, uh, ARM was done uh, and MSL grade one was found and then somebody started oxytocin almost immediately. So what are your comments on the CTG, Dr. Shashi? What would you say? Uh, you know, uh, ARM was done and then, then what happens on the CTG? Would you like to describe it? Yeah. After ARM, what I can see is that there is a slight deceleration. Yes, yes. Would you like and to describe? Again, yes. And then again, uh, there is acceleration. And uh, when she's when, uh, having acceleration, there is the beat to beat variability is maintained. But later on, again, there is significant deceleration, which is more than 25. Okay, okay. And then you see a phase of recovery, and, isn't it? And there is a phase of recovery, and shouldering is also yes. there. And so then it is maintaining. Right. So there is a phase of recovery with good baseline variability. And you can see that uh, the fetus has a baseline, which is almost the same as before. In fact, a little bit higher. Yes. So uh, would you worry about this? What would you say? No. How would you how would you react clinically? Yeah, to this? In this case, though, there was a fall in this uh, baseline heart rate, but later on, the baby has recovered and the bit to bit variability, if it is maintained, that means uh, baby is neurologically active and responding. So I think we should uh, uh, even if this is maintained, we should continue with this or what else we can do. Suppose if there is another fall, then we can, I would have reduced the oxytocin uh, dose or would have omitted oxytocin and would have seen again, not at this decision, I would have taken any 
prostate cancer. Uh, perfect, perfect, perfect. So uh, I am not even sure why oxytocin was started. She is having three contractions in ten minutes. Can I but just whatever. Add, can I just add? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, of course. That you know there are uh, in literature there are studies where people have shown that uh, after ARM definitely the fetal heart rate, abnormal fe fetal heart rate patterns are commoner. There was a large study where they showed that. Almost forty percent had decelerations after ARM, but they did not lead to any deleterious effect on the final outcome. That means they did not actually lead to more cesarean sections. But but it is just commoner after ARM. Yes, yes. So uh, and one more, Rinko, one more, one more, Rinko, one more, Rinko, one more thing I want to have yes, emphasize sure, for my PGs and juniors if they are there. Mm -hmm, you know. mm -hmm. So when you have done the ARM, at least wait for half an hour. Mm -hmm. contraction. Why should you start Sintosinon immediately? That's what I do. Yes, yes. So uh, I fully agree. And uh, even the RCOG guidelines, whenever they start uh, ARM, they say you wait for two hours before you start oxytocin. So I'm also not sure about the oxytocin bit. But like ma'am said that after ARM or after a PV examination, you know, sometimes these changes can happen because of mild cord compression. And mostly there is nothing to worry. Next slide, please. Another thing I would like to say that mm -hmm. I do agree that oxytocin was not required, but it was only one milli unit per minute. Yeah. So it, yes. The dose was very low. Yes, yes, yes. Next, please, ma'am. Yes. yes. So uh, now we have a CTG, um, which is showing a different kind of a pattern here. So I think I'll move on to Dr. Divya. Dr. Divya, are you there? Yeah, she's there. Dr. Divya, okay. unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Rinku, I'm here. Thank hi, you. Hi, Dr. Divya. So, Dr. Divya, the, the CTG has uh, is now shown on the main screen. Uh, what are your comments? So, is it for, of the same patient? Yes, same patient. The CTG is continuing and now it is the next phase. And All it right. is almost immediate. I mean, uh, I don't think there is much gap here. So, I, I will show you the last one. Last one was 6 o'clock and this is 9.30. Yeah, so uh, well, we have uh, the contractions are still within normal limits. We have three contractions in a in the, the period of ten uh, minutes. Then coming to the baseline heart rate, the baseline heart rate is still within normal limits. And then we come to the uh, beat to beat variability, which is also normal. And then we come to the decelerations. Mm -hmm. Now the decelerations are. Uh, uh, early, early decelerations, I would say, mm -hmm. and, and a slightly variable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are yeah. Hello. Your audio is gone, Doctor Divya. Maybe somebody else can take on. Doctor Deepthi. Yes. Dr. Yes. You want to comment? Yes. yes. So, uh, like Dr. Divya mentioned, that there are decelerations, and if you, if I look at the decelerations, they are beginning with the contractions. They are sharp right. decelerations. Right. They are like V shaped. The right. they are uh, trending down and coming up is sharp. And uh, once they are coming up, there is a mild shouldering. So right. I would take that as a normal, um, though I'm a bit concerned. So perhaps uh, Dr. Yenu Ma'am will tell me. Ma'am, as the wave is going up in the decel uh, deceleration, there is no variability. That's a sharp straight line. So will that's, that be considered? That's the shoulder. Yeah. Okay. So, no, so variability is good. Variability in between is fine. Yes, fine. So, yeah, variability is good. And the baseline heart rate is being maintained. And these are early decelerations. They are sharp ones, V shape. So I would take that as a normal thing. Maybe the patient, now that she's in six centimeters, so she's progressing. And I would still like to wait and not panic. Yes, so great. Yes. So here uh, we have a CTG where I wouldn't really, uh, you know, try and always label a CTG as a early, late, or variable. What is really important for me here is that are these decelerations omnious or not? No, they are so not they, omnious. They are, they are quickly falling and quickly picking up. The most yes. important thing is that they're recovering very fast, and that is very important. And it is great that they are not staying beyond the contraction. The variability is good and the baseline is good. These two things tell me that this baby is compensating for that transient hypoxia yeah. that is happening. So 
probably I don't need to worry. The good thing about the CTG is that the maternal pulse is clearly visible. So I know that this is a right uh, calculation of the fetal heart. And uh, I am not very happy with the contractions. I could, you know, it's probably five to six in 10 minutes on the border. So we need to see if the CTG is alive, if this oxytocin is still on, we could reduce the dose or even stop it, like Dr. Shashi just said. But uh, I would be okay because it is just five and 10 minutes, but then we can watch further and see what is happening. Please, Next, please. If you, if you see contractions, one, two, three, three and a half times, is that, is that too much, you think? Five, five and 10 minutes because I, I calculated. Yeah, five, yes, five, five and 10 minutes. minutes. I agree. Yeah, five and 10 minutes. So it, it's five. just on the border. It's on the border. We could watch and see. But because this mother is, uh, this fetus is also having variable decelerations, we could we could do with a little bit of less contractions and she would yes. progress. Yeah. Next, next slide, please. That there is good relaxation between. Yes. Uh, so uh, now it is 12.30 p.m. And uh, the CTG is looking like this now. Uh, I, I am not so sure about the in-between CTG, but I'm assuming that it is reassuring enough for us to wait. Now, uh, looking at this CTG, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ma, Kimani, Ma, Dr. Ma'am, uh, you want to take this? What, what are your comments on the CTG? So uh, uh, previously she was at nine, six, uh, six o'clock, she was uh, uh, six centimeters or nine o'clock, she was six centimeters. Nine thirty. Nine. Now, after three hours, she is eight centimeter. Okay. So she is dilating a little slow. Her maternal pulse has gone up, right? She's having tachycardia. And if I see the contractions, one, two, three, four, five, she has still five contractions. And uh, yes, they are decelerations are there. And if I see the baseline, I think the baseline has reduced a little bit. Um, variability is fine. And this one particular contraction has lasted a little longer. Yeah, long. But I still feel no, we can, one can wait. Yes. Yes, yes so, the baby has picked up. Uh, but the tachycardia, there is mother having fever. Yes. Uh, one thing which is very um, noticeable about the CTG is that the maternal and the fetal pulse are almost overlapping in parts of traces. So when I look at a CTG like that, I would be a little worried about, you know, differentiating the two because in, in places they are overlapping with each other. The maternal pulse has gone up. The reason we don't know, probably she's dehydrated in labor. Uh, progress is a little slow. But uh, like Dr. Manju Kemani said that these decelerations would still not worry me because the variability is fine. The baseline yeah. is okay. It is reassuring. And this Maybe fetus little hydration well. and uh, change your position, my dear. Well. Think of one thing. Think of one thing I want to highlight. Yes. So they say if the variable deceleration they are persisting for say 90 minutes, then one has to think. So from six o'clock, you know, when till nine thirty, three and a half hours variable deceleration is persisting. So, ma'am, uh, that is why I said you are absolutely mm -hmm. right. That is yeah. why I said the in between CTG must be okay for us to be waiting. We are assuming that, ma'am, okay. for the discussion. Okay. 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 And uh, we are also because uh, we don't even have the later part of this. We were actually trying to focus on the variable decelerations and the type of variable decelerations, which usually should not worry you. But yes, as far as the RCOG guidelines are concerned. These are variable decelerations with no concerning features. But if they are persisting for more than 90 minutes, we need to see what is happening. Like I said, we could reduce the contractions. That would have been the easiest thing to do. Right. So uh, that, that's fine. So this, this not case, abnormal. Huh, no, no, this is not abnormal. This is still suspicious, even if they, pro, uh, they, yeah. uh, they are there for more than 90 minutes. But like I keep saying, you know, ma'am, talking about suspicious normal pathological is no use unless we think about hypoxia. Is this baby at the moment uh, compensating for that hypoxia that is happening? According to all of us, the yeah, baby is compensating. compensating. And that is what matters. That because is what matters. So long the variability is good, this baby will not be acidotic. Yes. And anyway, yes. NST, you know, is good to tell us about the hypoxia. But it's bad to tell us about the acidosis. It will always be wrong, you know. You about that the is good. Acidosis. About the what? Acidosis, yes. Yeah, it doesn't tell us. That's why, you know, so many uh, crying babies come out when we think there's a fetal distress. Yes, yes. Because 
uh, hypoxia does not necessarily mean that the baby has metabolic acidosis. So those two things are not always hand in hand. Most babies who are hypoxic may not have metabolic acidosis at birth, but that's a different chapter altogether. So let's move on, ma'am, then. Uh, I think this baby had a uneventful delivery, had a vacuum because of maternal exhaustion and everything was well, although we don't have the cord blood ABG, but we assume it must, must have been fine. Can we move on, ma'am? Yes, please. Eight minutes, sorry. Okay, yeah, that's the next. Okay, so uh, this is the admission CTG uh, for this mother, 39 year old with isolated oligohydramnios and she's being induced. So um, I think it's, it's fine. I think most all of us will agree that there's nothing to worry, a lot of movements. And this was done at 12 morning. Next, please, ma'am. No, listen, listen, listen. Go back, go back to CTG, ma'am. Please, go back to See, there is no single baseline. Yes, yes. There is yes. no single baseline yes. in this particular CTG. And uh, ma'am, uh, very no, well pointed no. out. Yes, ma'am, no, very well pointed out. Not actually, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can I can I just finish? Actually, ma'am, um, uh, the the mother has marked a lot of movements here, and you know there is a phase of uh, a physiological phase which is called the active wakefulness phase where. The mother marks a lot of movements. They are sustained accelerations and the baseline okay. is not clearly discernible. It is probably that because physiological phase. Too many movements and accelerations in response. Exactly. Yes, yes. I should have discussed that. But like Manju ma'am said, that's a great lesson for us that the baseline has to be clearly understood because everything that we talk about, deceleration, acceleration, variability, is in relation to the baseline. If we don't have a baseline, we cannot talk about anything else. So I think the first thing that we should look for is a proper determinable baseline. Otherwise, we, the CTG will be indeterminable. But anyway, this was all fine, ma'am. Dr. Kimani, do you agree? I mean, can we move on? <laughs> this is a physiological... But I'll be a little more careful for this patient in the later. Still, I see a good... Okay. You will wait for the CTG to be fine before you yes. endure. Right? Yeah, yeah. Then you'll see a cyclicity. Ah. Yes. yes, that's perfect. Next, ma'am. I feel this is the baseline. You know, then yes. there is... Yes. This is a basic little bit. It could be better. <laughs> it could be better. With all these movements, if she hasn't yeah. so quickly, yeah. there's no time for baseline to remain. Yes. But yes. if you see, if you can see for one minute, there is a steady this thing. This is a baseline. I mean, uh, so ma'am, by definition, two minutes. Okay, I think both of you are right, so it's okay. <laughs> Ringo, I'll clarify here. I'll clarify um, here. Hmm. So ACOG hasn't updated its guidelines after two thousand and nine. Right. And according to ACOG, if the baseline is not there for two minutes, hmm. then you cannot consider that baseline. Though PIGU and hmm. RCOG, they say that you should measure the baseline in one minute. Hmm. Hmm. So, so ma'am, both, both of you are correct. <laughs> I, I, yes. I'm saying, ultimately, I mean, it, like like Rinku said, it is the... the, 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 the so actually, we have a lot of movements over here. Ma'am, can, we, can I say something? There are a lot of people who have That's why there are so many activations. In fact, it's a good start. Divya, have you got two devices? No, ma'am. There's an echo. Is your phone and, and something close by? Because you're getting too much people. Okay, I really don't know. Is it okay now, ma'am? It's better. It's better. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to just add to this. Since we are getting a lot of fetal movements, so the baby is really active and mobile, and hence the baseline is not so easily discernible. And I think it's a good, from my side, it's a very good. Uh, right. It's a baby which is showing the response and is an active baby. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, can we move on? Yeah. So this, this mother was induced with Cerviprim and Mesoprostol uh, after six hours in the morning. And then uh, three to four centimeter, 50% effaced. Uh, I'm not so sure about the ARM. Ma'am, was ARM done? Uh, not, not now, I believe. So oxytocin was started at 12. And at 8 p.m., an epidural was cited by demand. Move on, ma'am, please. Next slide. So this is the picture that we have here now. So, uh, Dr. Shashi, 
you want to comment uh, epidural was given epidural was uh, uh, given to this patient and post epidural uh, this is the ctg pattern so what do you what do you have to say about this post epidural here what i can see is there is a deceleration right and uh, then it is though it is uh, it is it has never reached the same level of 140 the uh, rate high heart rate is maintained at 120 in the beginning and then it is increasing but the variability is maintained yeah so so, okay. so uh, are you going to worry i mean uh, post epidural do you yeah, see not much to worry because variability is maintained and it is uh, and fetal heart rate is also has later on picked up at 140 right right so post epidural probably because of transient maternal hypotension we do see some of these ctg features uh, off and on but we have to move on and carry on the ctg and as you can see here the ctg has gone on uh, to have a okay variability and a baseline can we move on now can Next i slide ma'am can i yes, just ma'am any panelists wants to comment please yes please do please do because all everybody is very senior, so I mean, sure, if you sure, have an opinion, say it, please. No, that is uh, that is what, ma'am. Uh, I think you were wanting to show us that immediately post epidural, there was a fall in the baseline yes. heart rate. Yes. Uh, from from one forty, it's gone down to almost uh, one ten. Hmm. But then after about uh, three minutes. Three minutes, yes, it's yes. picked up again, and then mm -hmm. eventually it comes to the it's come down to over from where we started. Yeah. The variability yeah, yeah. is maintained throughout, and then in the initial part there were decelerations, but then onwards we find that there are no decelerations. In fact, there is even an acceleration, one solid. Yeah. 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 Yes. So yeah. and one so shouldn't that panic. one should the lesson to learn is that one shouldn't panic right. immediately. Right. Okay. So now we come to the most difficult part. <laughs> so, ma'am, what is the time here, Dr. Renu, ma'am? I, I can't see the time very clearly. You know, uh, this is after how many hours the next CTG? On 30 the PM. 8 30, 8 40, and then this CTG starts here. This is 11 o'clock, 11 40, 11 50. So, a so couple of hours later, a couple of hours later, and we don't have the contraction, uh, unfortunately, graph here, but uh, okay, whatever. She's in labor, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Divya, you want to, yes. you want to uh, comment on the CTG? So actually, I can't see the basal heart rate written because it's very it's faded out. So I yeah, I can see it now. So our basal heart rate, baseline heart rate, is uh, not visible. There are a number of accelerations, and uh, if we take the average uh, of these accelerations going up and down then the baseline heart rate would be within normal limits, which would be around 130. Uh, and uh, the base, uh, the B2B variability is there. And uh, the shouldering is there. Once the decelerations come up, there is shouldering. And then finally, the baseline heart rate goes up. And then it goes up right up till 150, 160. And so this is the la uh, last part of the uh, thing where syntosin on was restarted. So there was a bit of fetal tachycardia, one would say just a non-reassuring kind of fetal tachycardia. So all in all, without the contractions, it appears that uh, one has to be careful with this kind of a CTG. But I would yet not take a decision to say, yes, this is absolutely pathological and one must uh, go ahead with the cesarean section. So, uh, uh, ma'am, so may, may I make is, a comment, is please? Is this baby oh, having hypoxia? Is this baby having hypoxia? So, ma'am, what is the maternal heart rate in this particular situation? Yeah. I so can't again, read. So again, it is not mentioned, but I am assuming that it is it is normal and well differentiable from the fetal heart rate. Ma'am, yeah, okay. this is so, very feeble. Uh, I just wanted to know where is this higher peak at 160, 180 or what? One peak has gone up to 180. It's very feeble. Uh, Ma'am, would you call this a sinusoidal pattern? No. no I can't no. see. For I would like two things. Uh, will they be called accelerations? Because I can't see the basal um, heart rate. Would this be a sinusoidal pattern? Would I confuse this with the maternal heart rate pattern? Or there is some... Because 
So uh, the uh, central part the, of the graph is what is worry, the worrisome. confusion with the maternal heart rate is is very much uh, justified. I'm assuming that the maternal heart rate is absolutely differentiable and separate. This is the fetal heart rate. Let's let's discuss okay. it as the fetal heart. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Manju, ma'am, you want to say you supposing you see a pattern like this, the mother is on Manju, oxytocin and on epidural. What okay, would you? So, uh, epidural was, oxytocin. Uh, uh, in the previous contractions, in ten minutes there were six contractions. So I would have reduced into here at the contractions, but there is no fixed uh, variability. See, uh, there is no fixed baseline here. Yes. Yeah, there is no fixed baseline. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say that these are, you know, uh, uh, variable deceleration. No, I will not say. There is no fixed baseline and there are acceleration. But following this, you know, we have to observe the patient, you know. So when we are observing, there is a rising tachycardia. But variability, little bit is still there. I would still like to observe it for some more time before I take any action. So uh, like all of you rightly said that this is what we typically call a CTG, which we cannot understand properly. And uh, because the baseline is not clear, we don't know whether these are decelerations or accelerations. The only thing we can say is that the variability is there. It, it is not uh, It is not as if yeah, the variability is totally to absent. The blessings after this also. Yes. So, uh, so you know, uh, we could just wait and watch. But like Dr. Manju Ma'am said, I would also not be comfortable with oxytocin with a trace like this. I would stop it completely. And for a long time, you know, and will not be in a hurry to restart the oxytocin. So anyway, uh, it was restarted. Ma'am, Dr. Renu, can we see the next, uh, next, please? I also feel that this is a typical trace which you cannot categorize. You cannot say these are accelerations or decelerations. But if you ask me, if I look at the baseline which you see later, to me, these look like decelerations and not acceleration. Because if you see the baseline here, you know what she is achieving after, then to me, they are looking more like decelerations. But, but it is not clear. That's absolutely right. I don't agree with you. This is change in the baseline. Yes. This is change in the baseline. Change in the yeah. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Wait, so wait, now wait. Uh, the oxytocin is still on. And uh, the next part of the CTG, again, we see this, this last part there. Now we have a contraction graph, which I would also like you to comment. Uh, Dr. Uh, Deepti, maybe Dr. Deepti, ma'am, you yes. want to comment on this? Yeah. Yes. So now in the initial part, of the graph, the heart rate is 160, even touching mm -hmm. up to 170. And then the heart rate starts falling down. It's come mm -hmm. down to 100. So there is a bradycardia over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, or a deceleration, I would say, a prolonged deceleration from 150, it comes down. But then, uh, and then again, mm -hmm. there are contractions. Again, yes, the same, the same pattern starts mm -hmm. then again when there is no fixed uh, basal heart rate and again with the and uh, since they are combining with the uh, contractions. So again, I'm confused whether I would consider so, them as right. accelerations so or any decelerations. Any comments on the contractions, ma'am? Any comments yes, on they, the contractions? They are, again, oh. once we restarted the syntesonon, again, I would say that the contractions are more than I would like them to be. They're coming right. up too fast. Yes. yes, yes. So the contractions. So, uh, are... I think the only good thing about the CTG is that the variability does yeah, not persist. That the pattern does not persist. You, yeah. you stop the oxytocin and it becomes kind yeah. of a little more normal. Yes. And then there are when you restart, it goes back to from the earlier yes. situation. Yes. So, no, in any in CTG, oh, yes. can I comment? The variability over here has started decreasing as compared to before, you know. I cannot comment, you know, just how much is the variability because the letters are too small. But variability, yes. it is there, but it is decreased. It is not yes. very good variability. Yes, okay. So that would be definitely yes. a subjective assessment. But uh, the picture, the good thing is that the, the, the CTG is changing its picture. It becomes a little more normal and yeah, then but becomes like, indeterminate. It is again picked up yes. and uh, the accelerations can be seen and comment. the variability at one place is again maintained. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can I comment? Yes, yeah. of course. 
so dr rinku what uh, abnormality there is in this um, ctg the main thing is that there are too many contractions there are five yes, contractions in, the, in 10 minutes Great. if we manage to uh, control the contractions by stopping sento or giving terbutaline if it is required that is if yes, there is no yes, yes. then so, we will be able to get the fetal heart rate back on track yes. Yes, so yes. One can make out. That is what it seems, right? And terbutaline is not available in most of our places. So, ma'am, the easiest thing to give is a nitroglycerine sub uh, spray sublingually, four hundred microgram. That works very well, and that is available online. So, that is something which we we could have tried in this patient. Next, please, ma'am, Doctor Renu, ma'am. Your first action. Stop, sir. Okay. Panelist, please stop. Stop synthesizing because stop, once we restart, on. the same CTG and findings. The first so thing, stop the position will also help and stop synthesizing because it yes. is it becomes and a bizarre pattern which you don't know. What's yes. 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 So the was stopped again. Okay. Now, ma'am, next, please. Okay. So, uh, whose turn is it, ma'am? <laughs> anyway, Dr. Shashi. Dr. Shashi, you want to comment on this? CTG. So now it is one twenty a.m. and these are the findings. So we have to also look uh, how far we are from the marathon end, isn't it? This is a like a marathon journey for us. So now she is fully dilated, but head is still at minus one. And this is the CTG, Doctor Shashi. Is, what would you like to do? There is catheter formation also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So see here again, the rate is uh, there. There are accelerations, and rate is being maintained baseline. Between one forty to one sixty, but uh, yes, with yes. with capat, I think uh, uh, patient may take longer time. So we have to yes, yes, use yes. some. We, we have to expedite the second stage of delivery. Okay, okay. Can't expedite at minus one. What will you do? One has to rule out CPD. Yes. One has to rule. Okay. Out. It okay. is still at minus one, huh? Okay. Besides the graph, looking yeah. at the clinical situation, that the head is still stuck at minus one. And yes. it is fully dilated, yeah. and there is a capet formation. So, so I would, I think, keeping the clinical situation in mind, I would. Most uh, of you will agree that, uh, that you know, maybe doing will go cesarean. minus. We cannot use any instrument at this. Yes. Yes. So we have to go for a section. Bailing out the baby is a better option. Next, next slide, please, ma'am. I think one more comment that should have been um, there on the previous. Sorry, on the previous slide. Should be that when you stop into do a PV to see how far is she, you know, because we need to take decision with these bizarre sort of patterns, isn't it? Anyway. Yes, I agree with you. Huh? Okay. Yes. So next slide. So finally, finally, what happens? Let's finish the story now. So a cesarean was done. Unfortunately, there was a difficulty in delivery of the head, and um, the baby took quite long to come out. In fact, six to seven minutes. and uh, it was it was a nightmare for the consultant and the team but fortunately the baby came out with bag and mask and um, the the arterial cord blood gas is available not the vbg but the arterial cord bl blood gas is not too bad at least, at least it is not less than 7 uh, move on ma'am let's let's see the next slide please baby was 3.3 kg okay the mother was obese but uh, a weight of 3.3 kg not not too much baby was on cpap but had seizures at 7 and 10 hours although recovered very fast breastfed after 48 hours and then uh, there was a birth injury in the form of clump case paralysis which is the brachial plexus injury at the lower end and uh, otherwise the baby did well there was a, a mri showed a small cortical diffusion restriction area but this happens very commonly after seizures and we are following up the baby the next slide please of course this is a picture at 4 months of age next slide and uh, but the baby is doing fine it's been now at least 3 years uh, 2016 born 4 years actually and the baby is fine now um what are the lessons learned uh, i think uh, anybody can answer any of the panelists from this so this is something which was there on my mind from the very first slide yeah. that why at afi of 3 was the patient taken up for induction of labor and why not an elective c section was done so uh, dr manju kimani you agree every mother with isolated oligohydramnios with dopplers normal okay. everything normal See, no no normal in, in this in this particular patient hmm uh, 
she is 39 years of age she is at the back of a reproductive career hmm. i mean had this baby been cerebral palsy or something we would have been in so one thing secondly if we go back now retrospectively we are wiser that the, hmm. it was always a bizarre pattern and hmm. she had a long way to go so, so do you think in- ma'am do you think the abnormal ctg was really uh, the cause of hypoxia don't you think that the baby got stuck for a long time it, it it took 6 to 7 minutes for the baby to come out and then also the baby's abg was 7.08 yes so yes, there ma'am. is a school of thought there is there is there is a, a a line of thinking that probably that ctg was not the cause of the problem the cause no, of the problem no, no, no. was something else but no, what even it is one more thing i would like to add uh, no, uh, sure ma'am sure See, this patient is thirty-nine year old, and uh, there was only one head drum news. Okay, yes. and yes. Uh, oxytocin was was once given, and later on it was stopped, and then it was then why was it started so again? So I would have said yes. in this case, at thirty-nine years, hmm. we should have thought some other way before starting the second oxytocin. Yes, of course, I fully agree. So, ma'am. Anyway, since it is a CTG discussion, let's move on fast. I think we'll yeah. run short of time, but I think the most important lesson is that some CTGs we will never know and we will yeah. never understand, and yeah. we need two opinions, three opinions. We should be liberal enough to have as many people in to understand and to see at the entire clinical picture before taking any decision. Okay, ma'am. Doctor Renu, please move on, ma'am. We are running short of time. <laughs> डॉक्टर there was no hypoxia to the baby during her intrapartum time the ctg does not show anywhere uh, the blood gas also shows that the uh, ph was 70.08 uh, so we are clear on the ctg absolutely even yes. medico legally is yes. just that it took time to deliver the patient the baby and that is where the problem uh, happened mm-hmm. and that is why the uh, uh, brachial plexus also got paralyzed and there was just a newborn seizure at 4 years the baby is fine we do come across such things but it does not mean that this ctg yes. was uh, somewhere incorrect yeah, this okay. baby recovered only because this, this baby was not hypoxic yes mm-hmm. yes yeah uh, yeah but uh, you see ma'am with babies having seizures 60% babies recover and a few babies don't but okay fine i mean we had a very nice discussion i think a uh, lot of food for thought i yes. think <laughs> That okay, is, ma'am. That is what we are here for. We need and to. And thank you, thank you, Doctor Devia, for your comments. Really appreciate. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, the next case. This is a primary gravida, thirty-five weeks of pregnancy, admitted at twelve noon with clear leaking for three hours. She had she started with mild contractions at six o'clock. So the first CTG is uh, from the time that she started. Mm-hmm. so um, this ctg looks pretty good i mean baseline is 140 accelerations baseline variability so i don't think i'm going to ask anybody anything and she is in early labor she is getting about two contractions in 10 minutes which is also fine so let's move on okay so um, now 8 o'clock if you want to see the timeline back 6 o'clock patient is is uh, having mild contractions just one to two contractions and we haven't given her anything Eight o'clock, a mesoprostol is given, twenty-five micrograms sublingual. One fifteen, which is like five hours later, she is three centimeters, seventy percent effaced. Station zero to plus one, bag of membrane plus, ARM is done, and there is meconium stain liquor. And if you see the timeline on the CTG, then it is actually starting almost this time when the PV was done, one fifteen a.m. because it is one twenty here. So you take it that this CTG starts from this PV. Three centimeter bag of membrane ARM is done, and meconium stained liquor is there. So, um, Dr. Deepthi, maybe I start with you. What do you think of this CTG? So, ma'am, first of all, I look at the contractions. They are more than what we really need, and they're coming too fast, and they're there. 
and looking at the ctg findings there is there are decelerations now pronounced decelerations and they are variable decelerations some they are or rather late because they are coming after the contraction has even passed so i won't even even call them late ma'am they are variable decelerations and uh, there is loss of variability also so keeping in mind two abnormal features decelerations and uh, also loss of variability and the contractions are coming too fast rather if you see this this is 10 minutes from here to here okay yes you have one two three four five six seven eight contractions no no these are these are only this is only one contraction see you cannot have one there are only three contractions one two three that's it in 10 minutes so three contraction but ma'am looking at the graph there is there are decelerations yeah, there are variable deceleration agree and there is loss of variability also and concerning factors it is reaching till 60 there are no shoulder yeah so not a good city anybody else wants to comment on the variability and ma'am would i can i say that there is that w pattern at the end of the deceleration so that biphasic thing is there so no. that is again uh, not a very good uh, feature no, how do you call it biphasic they are just it's going down and coming up so in the first deceleration if you look so, like a w shaped yes yes ma'am Uh, anybody else has a comment on variability do you think the variability is less normal less i would so, say it's less okay so the the good the the only i mean the few good things that the baby has is the baby is uh, is coming back to its baseline although for a this is a typical subacute hypoxia pattern the baby is coming back to the baseline for 2 minutes Mm. but 2 minutes or 1 and 1/2 minutes but staying more in the deceleration phase we, yeah. we need to do something we need to see what why but, it's happening isn't it exactly. but but uh, i mean the bad point is that there are decelerations hmm good hmm. thing and and the other bad thing is they're going down up to 60 yes good yes. things are that uh, it is coming back coming to, back to baseline i am Variability. And the variability is, oh, I mean, there it's not very, very reduced. I think of at least a seven, five, six. And variability is good, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, of course uh, there are deceleration. But no deceleration is going too low. That is yeah. important. Sixteen. Only three centimeters, you know. What would you like mm -hmm. to do? See, effect of mesoprostol has gone. If mesoprostol was given at eight pm, it's one fifteen, nine, ten, eleven. It's four, five hours. So yes. it is spontaneous this thing, you know. So it is not the mesoprostol. Which yes, I mean, can I can can I just uh, remind everybody? This is immediately after an ARM. Okay. Has, has anybody said so that? So that right. that that could be because of cord pro, uh, cord prolapse compression. or cord compression. But cord so, compressions would have led to accelerations rather than decelerations. No, no. Cord, this is oh, a. I would cord prolapse. I would say this is a sorry, sorry, Doctor Dutti. No, 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 no please wait. <laughs> so I would say this is a cord compression, yeah. and it's a non. I would put it in a non-reassuring uh, graph. I would watch the patient if the uh, because you know as far as the beat to beat variability in the baseline is concerned, uh, it's all right. But when if you look at the decelerations, definitely there is a reduced. Um, B to B to variability, so I feel. So th uh, there is a non-reassuring factor, and we will not let this continue for another thirty minutes. We have to change the position of the mother definitely. Uh, so if it is cord compression, that will get um, uh, corrected, and we have to watch her for about next thirty minutes. If it doesn't get corrected, then yes, it will come. We have to do a pervasional examination also for cord. If there is a compression there, or whether there is yes. cord prolapse. Mm -hmm. yeah. i think i agree with all of you i think this is cord compression very typically cord compression variable decelerations I, my personal opinion is that the baseline variability is still good but decelerations are going down and the first thing we need to do is to do intrauterine resuscitation the first thing is to change the patient change the position is absolutely important so this is what has happened well nowadays i don't know rinku whether we have stopped giving oxygen but earlier we used to give ringer lactate fast this is 2016 case of and course mm. so left lateral and you see this is the change which has happened after simple lat left lateral position mm -hmm. Mm. so dr divya what do you say now uh, we are happy now ma'am uh, after change of position 
and uh, now uh, the beat to beat variability the baseline heart rate as well as the decelerations are concerned the decelerations are still uh, kind of troubling um, us because and this pattern is still non reassuring i will still watch this patient yeah but uh, how uh, are you feeling more comfortable compared to the earlier one yes, uh, yes. slightly com- more comfortable but uh, the decelerations are still right. there and only I mean, in, in as a, uh, if you look at it quickly at which one this is the new one yeah uh, so this uh, this has a good baseline uh, the number of decelerations are less and they're also not going that far as in the previous I one i can see short yes they were going also. up to 60 here the bit to bit variability is maintained also so this is variability. a better picture better, better picture definitely better definitely the variability is maintained when there is a little shallow deceleration yeah. they are maintained throughout deceleration and the, the deepest uh, nadir is 100 100 or it was 60 okay okay uh, so what 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 do you want to do you want just want to watch her yes yeah. watch her manjudi aap kuch aur karna chahengi Hey, right now it looks reassuring so I'll, i mean not that bad as it was so we can uh, still wait yeah. so how how you know i mean it is magical left lateral position can yes. change much so probably the cord compression must have also got you know lifted up okay so this is now 2 am i let me tell you this was this was 150 2 am so it is in continuation okay okay so this is 2 am patient is bearing down so this is the second stage stress are you unhappy manjudi will ask patients to stop bearing down you know so that the previous heart yeah. rate recovers you know she's bearing down and with the constant that's why it's getting going down you know but still it is you know uh, recovering fast the uh, variability is good you know but here it is bad yeah. or maybe it's the uh, not recorded properly i think recording i mean yeah. uh, unless you have a fetal scalp electrode you will not have every beat mm-hmm. but it's quite you know you can see that the baseline is here and the decelerations are here so they are still wave variable decelerations slightly worse than than previous so you, would you like to consider instrumental any of you that's what i wanted to ask so rinko in sex stage this uh, asphyxia sets in very fast so mm-hmm. once careful at this stage you know if the patient yes. is you know fit enough for the vacuum delivery it is better to remove the baby rather than putting the baby and to yes. proving that yes i took out you know uh, non acidotic no we don't have to prove anything we have to have a happy crying baby so do a fast mm-hmm. vacuum delivery if the patient is fit yeah but if the baby is at head is at minus 1 uh, or 0 then one has to think what will you do hmm. so basically this was um, like it started around 2 o'clock and this is only about 15 minutes trace and yeah. uh, but but you can i would like to say one thing yeah Here's yes the deceleration in touching up to 70 yeah so we may use instruments in this case we can we can go for an instrumental delivery in this case depending upon the station of the head yeah, yeah depending so that that definitely can be a consideration when you see can i say something ma'am yes, can please. i say something yes. so in this patient firstly i mean if we could try it we have to uh, ask the patient to stop bearing down we have to change her position because usually we make the patient bear down in a supine position these are variable decelerations so we ask her to stop bearing down we put her in a left lateral and then again observe and if everything uh, gets back to normal then probably you know i mean of course it's recommended also nowadays that we can ask her to uh, uh, push down in a different position maybe a squatting position or a, a something like that not a supine position Right. so that is uh, one possibility yes, yes in a kneeling position point very well taken sometimes decelerations improve when mother changes position like in the kneeling position we very comfortably do delivery sometimes there is also okay. one one more guideline where people say make her push alternate contractions you know yes. Yes. that's one of them okay so mm-hmm. i think let's move I think for another you know in my labor you know we have small pillows you know which we put underneath the patient's this thing and so mm-hmm. she the spine but slightly tilted or maybe you know i put four, four three you know these ringer selected bottle so patient is tilted mm-hmm. you know at least so that compression is gone you know so we can put the base on one side hmm yeah i'm slightly in the upright position okay. rather than in the even like so we raise the head side of the table make it almost at uh, 60 degrees so mm-hmm. she's like sitting on a sofa 
right, right. So i i visited a center in uh, hyderabad where they were making the patient they had ropes tied from the roof and they were making them you know they were holding on to the the ropes and bearing down in sitting position squatting yeah. in aurangabad also ma'am in medical college lots of different types of methods have been done and different types of beds yeah. and their propositions it is more physiological than lying down it is more physiological yeah. yes okay so anyway it, this baby delivered uh, in half an hour uh, of ha- second stage which was not uh, prolonged 2.2 kilos and good apgar no instrument used and the baby was fine okay let's move on to the next case so this patient is 30 years primy 39 plus 4 weeks hypothyroid cholestasis came to the labor room with pain abdomen for 5 hours 8 o'clock in the morning she was 2 cm 70% effaced vertex at minus 1 bag of membrane plus written rop uterine contractions were 2 20 to 25 seconds every 3 to 4 minutes so early labor ctg was completely reactive so i have not put the ctg now 4 hours later 12 noon she is 3 cm 90% efface minus 2 to minus 1 i think this should have been minus 1 only because it was minus 1 it won't go back anyway should be minus 1 arm was done and clear like a 1 o'clock oxytocin infusion is started at 1.5 milli units per minute we generally use a low dose protocol so it is started with 1.5 and 4 o'clock patient has an epidural so 1 o'clock oxytocin started 4 o'clock epidural this is the next ctg so this ctg is at 4 the, the prior ctg is reassuring isn't it yeah, that's what we have to so 4 o'clock patient had epidural and this this tray starts from 440 i mean 435 you can say this ctg starts and this is the tracing we've got dr manju what is so your if I, if i see the contractions uh, maternal heart rate is fine if i see the contractions they are 5 in 10 minutes that's also fine but again you know with each contraction she is having a drop but it is the shouldering is over here Uh, there is no fixed baseline variability is reduced but it is still there you know maybe we can try left lateral and you know see how she is behaving but it is non reassuring there are no pathological features in this ctg according to me true true so what would you like to do actually uh, well, how much was she dilated this time and i'll stop syntosinon which was going at this rate you know because let the baby recover during contraction mm-hmm. and give her you know some uh, left lateral position intravenous fluid i still follow but uh, how many observe con- the, observe the ctg for another 10 15 minutes to see with all these changes is it recovering so what we agree is that these are variable decelerations that uh, there is still beat to beat variability is maintained it's certainly more than 5 and the decelerations are going maximum up to 100 well 110 and uh, so it is non reassuring but not pathological so one can wait and watch and this is the next so dr shashi do you like to take this one this is now 550 so if i just remind you that the last one was 440 pm and this has uh, like till 5 o'clock it has gone on here and this is 550 so it's almost like immediate so this is the ctg now Sintosinone is still going. It has not been stopped, by the way. So this is the CTG, Doctor Shashi. Yeah. So five fifty. She had two decelerations, and then uh, baseline is maintained around one seventy, and there are multiple decelerations. Like one deceleration has gone up to eighty also. What is the there? Are- in the previous ctg in this one how do you think it's getting better worse same baseline is rising it is based on is reached baseline is rising 180 180 mm. here yeah, baseline yeah. is 180 pathology is rising 180, and the depth of the deceleration depth, depth of the deceleration is also at one point it has decreased a lot up to, has gone up to 80 80 yeah. and variability. significant variability deceleration was up yeah. even the previous one and it's a very short deceleration yeah. not even half a minute yeah it's not probably so worrying but i think but in this the deceleration is little worrying this especially the one which has gone up to 80 no but that's a good deceleration i would this is also up to 80 yeah. Yeah. and uh, and the other thing is that this deceleration is very short it just goes yes. down yeah. 
So this yes, is not correct. Yes, but ma'am, the base, again, but, but the, the base, soldering is there and bit to bit variability is almost the baseline heart rate has but baseline, baseline heart rate has increased has gone up to 180 yes yes, yes. So, so that is the point to worry sorry ma'am yeah yeah yes dr divya so uh, we have a fetal tachycardia uh, over here mm -hmm. and this is a non reassuring pattern right now it's not pathological yet right so we have to watch her closely and right. we have to come to a decision in the next few minutes yeah. next 30. There is one pathological feature that heart rate is in a, uh, the baseline heart has gone up in a pathological this thing, but variability is still there. So one uh, this thing. Uh, there is not uh, hypox much hypoxia because variability is still there. Logically, it will uh, have to be more than one. Mother's pulse is fine. Yeah, yeah. Yes, mother's pulse is fine. See, uh, heart rate is more like one seventy. It is still not more still than. Limit, yeah. Yes. It's not pathological. Yeah. Not, not pathological. It's non reassuring. There are non reassuring. Non reassuring features. So we have to change the position. We have to hydrate her, yeah. and yeah. Uh, we can yeah. still watch. And yeah. now, would you say that there are two non reassuring features now: deceleration as well as change in the uh, basal heart rate. Except for the variability, two things are which are not very assuring. Are not so worrying, but more. I mean, two non reassuring features which have cropped up now is the beat to beat variability has become less compared to the yes. previous, and the heart rate has climbed up, which climbed up. because of dehydration, maybe because of slight hypoxia. So that's why, yeah, still we can so, watch after hydrating, after changing position. Yeah, if the decelerations become wider, deeper, I would be. You know, looking out for those right. decelerations becoming more ominous, deeper and wider. Absolutely. More, uh, you know, less variability. Well, we would not want to know, do a PV and know how far is she yes. in the progressing. Yes. That's <laughs> the biggest question, you know. Yes. I mean, five centimeter, maybe I'm not going to wait and do a section, isn't it? Yes. So, okay, let's see what happened. So this is 550 and the trace here is still 610. Okay. okay. So we are almost in 6.30, patient is fully dilated and effaced. Okay. So, so that obviously that trace warranted a PV examination. That was very important because you can't take a decision unless you take the clinical picture in. So PV was fully dilated and effaced, vertex at plus one, membranes absent. And this patient went on to have a vacuum delivery, um, delivered at 844 for poor maternal effort because she was not bearing down. A baby was quite all right, eight and nine, uh, APCAR. Baby had some respiratory distress. No, it did have respiratory distress. Required bag and tube ventilation and stayed in the nursery for three days and then discharged in satisfactory condition. So, okay. So still, I mean. So we now have some uh, rapid fire cases where just take, just take 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and just say it. You know, we don't want to go into details because it's already 5.13, and Dr. Malvika is going to throw us out very soon. <laughs> um, these are rapid fire. So, Rinku, you can start with the first one. Yes. So, I'll start with Dr. Deepti. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Deepti, please. So, uh, this is a second gravida, para 1, with diabetes. Uh, and she is presented at 36 weeks and 5 days with loss of fetal movements for one day. The nurse puts her on the monitor, as they always do. What are your comments? So, the basal heart rate is at 110. So, heart rate is maintained at 110. I can see she's not in labor, but I can see no contractions. Yes. And uh, there are no contractions at all, just the uh, basal heart rate, good variability, and, uh, mm. and the duration of this graph is from uh, timings, uh, it is almost uh, 10, 20 minutes graph, and uh, maybe the baby is sleeping pattern. Okay, anybody else who has I a just would like to point out, this is a 36 it? weeks, uh, 5 weeks baby. So that's why the in those cases, fetal heart rate may be around 110 to 120. Okay, so anybody else who has a comment? Okay, fine. Dr. Shashi, well taken. Who, who, who else wants to comment on the CTG? So shall I uh, expand? Yes. Some, some decelerations are there till 100 over here. 
okay for no so, i mean the base weight uh, heart rate is going to right. 100 and then so to the utter surprise this is a real case okay so this was a macerated iud so this so entire that, thing oh is the maternal heart rate oh god so it is really really important to check the the fetal heart rate with a stethoscope or with your okay. uh, you know fetoscope before you put the ctg ctg monitor on i think this is the most important take home message that we have for the day okay next so next please so dr uh, divya dr divya yeah. yes dr inku you want to comment on this so this is a second gravida previous cesarean early labor and um, she is in labor she is getting these contractions i don't know how clearly you can see the first ctg and then the second ctg so what is your diagnosis so ma'am this patient is in labor she is a case mm. of previous cesarean section and she is in early labor uh she is getting a lot of contractions um mm -hmm. uh, whatever i can make out i'm sure they are more than uh, 3 in 10 minutes yes and yes. Uh, um the fetal heart rate though it's not very clear from here but the fetal heart rate appears to be okay the beat to beat variability seems to be fine i really can't make out and uh, the second uh, ctg pulse, pulse pulse rate and maternal heart they are almost same you can't see differentiation Yes, so so you know she went she went on to have a bradycardia in the second CTG. You can see that. So, ma'am, would we say that in the second half there are no contractions at all? There are uh, absence of contractions in the second no, part no, of the graph. No, 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 not at all. But the the toe show the show the slide. I think this. Yeah, ah, the toe yeah. was moved off because the okay. patient was being wheeled uh, onto the trolley, and you know we just took the CTG in a hurry. It okay. was a case. Okay, so what 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 could be the possible diagnosis? Rupture, 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 Oh, not even the hyphens yes <laughs> so you have asked uh, uh, rinku kisse pucha aapne oh, dr himani aur dr shashi uh, bache hain <laughs> okay okay all right so um, dr manju this patient mm -hmm. is third gravida with previous two normal deliveries came in active labor ctg was reactive i have not shown you the earlier ctg which was reactive pv was 50% effaced 5 cm head at minus 3 ARM was done, and this CTG is post ARM. What is your comment? So here there is a prolonged deceleration, say two and a half minutes, right? But then the variability is good. But again, there is a deceleration till sixty, but the variability is good. Yes, we have to be careful. That's it, ma'am. Diagnosis. No, I mean, do you like to? Correct. Possible diagnosis. Anything you like to exclude? Heart uh, prolapse. He just had an ARM. He had what? He just had an ARM. Head at minus three. Heart prolapse. Heart prolapse. Yeah, yeah. So this was heart prolapse, and patient was wheeled to the OT immediately. So, so the, the obviously the message is we should not be doing ARMs at minus three unless they are very controlled. Okay. So Dr. Deepthi, right? Yes, Dr. Deepthi, this is very interesting. Uh, so this was a lady, second gravida, previous one abortion, so practically a primary, thirty-nine weeks, six days, admitted in early labor, eight o'clock, PV is two centimeter, fifty percent efface, head is at minus two station, and CTG is reactive. This is the CTG which I am calling reactive. So have a look at this CTG before I move. Yes. So are you happy with this CTG? Yes, ma'am. The basal heart rate is maintained. There are no significant accelerations. The variability. There are accelerations. Good variability. Yes. So, yes. No. So react to CTG. Yeah. Okay. So this is at one o'clock. Uh, oh dear, I was not going to show you this. Just a minute. I have to animate. I forgot. Anyway, that's okay, ma'am. We can still talk about it. <laughs> 
So this was five centimeter ARM done MSL grade three. So she was taken up for uh, no, uh, sorry. This was the CTG on at one o'clock. So the earlier one was eight AM. This is yes. five hours later. This was the CTG on um, uh, abdominal. The cardio was abdominal. So because it was so erratic, we couldn't really see what was the baseline. What was yes. We put yes. a, a fetal scalp electrode. Okay. And this is the CTG on fetal scalp. This this disappeared, and only this was there, okay. which was about seventy five beats per minute. So that is why cesarean section was done, and uh, but baby there was no sign of hypoxia. Apgar was eight and nine. <laughs> the on showed when topics in trigeminal. So, but the reason, ma'am, because in this particular graph, this is almost like a straight line. There is no variability. There are no decelerations. I think it's for a steady line. Ma'am, there are missed beats, so we can't determine the CTG properly. It is very difficult to understand the CTG. They're patchy. And another thing is that I do not know how we. Well, what was the reason system. behind this low fetal heart rate? Was there any high risk or anything happened? Ectopics, ventricular ectopics. ECG. Okay. So okay. So I had a similar case with the fetal heart, heart Yeah. Yes, Doctor Divya. Yeah, so I also had a case of complete heart block of the fetus and had a similar kind of a shoulders, a similar kind of a trace. So one has to be careful, you know, like one has to know what is going on with the baby's uh, actual heart activity. You get a fetal echocardiography and all those kind of things done, and then decide on the, the yes. exact uh, CTG tracing. But it. in labor, a lot of them land up in sections, ma'am, because it is very difficult to monitor them on the CTG. Yes, true. Mm -hmm. What they say that you could do a uh, uh, ultrasound in the labor ward and look at the baby's heart. But the other problem you see, ARM, it was a thick paste like meconium, and it is actually contradictory when I tell you Apgar is eight and nine and yes. baby fine, no sign of hypoxia. So, um, but, but there was, I mean, thick meconium. So even without Even if there was not this trace, probably somebody would have done us. Uh, yes, system. with that thick yes. meconium, would have taken a decision. Mm -hmm. Section. No, but anyway, this was the case. So the baby was followed up till about three months, and uh, they say that these can be transient, and slowly they with as by end of three months they are over. Yeah. So I think that is so the exam finished. <laughs> 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 Whether we can ask you the right questions? <laughs> Even more worried that we will ask you the right questions. Not at all. We we did uh, we uh, while we reviewed the literature, we uh, read about fetal scalp stimulation. Is that still being followed or just yes. what we read? Yes, of course. That should it's be very, done. It's very useful, ma'am. It's very it's useful. Very Even any oh, any PTG oh, which we don't understand properly, we can do a scalp stimulation. Be reassured. Both nice guidelines and SOGC guidelines. They say that if you are in doubt, do a scalp stimulation. Yes, yeah. scalp yeah. stimulation can be done easily because fetal yeah. blood sampling is not that yeah. simple. It is more cumbersome, so cumbersome. and not available also easily. And even if with the scalp stimulation, there are accelerations. So that means that baby is yeah, baby is yeah. not yeah. helpful. So initially, as soon as the baby, as the mother comes in, when she comes in for a first checkup, so the first PV also should have a uh, fetal um, you know, scalp stimulation. You know, just by uh, finger poking the finger, yeah. and if it is positive, like if there is an acceleration, it's good. It shows that the baby is going to probably do well. Exactly. And whenever one does a PV, then one does this. One can always do it. Yes. Yeah. No, but then when you do I it, I just wanted to add one thing for the audience. Like in one case, we discussed there was cord prolapse and there was a crash CS. So in that case, I would just like to tell them that if there is a cord prolapse, then you fill the bladder there. And when while taking to the OT and after opening the abdomen and making a nick on the peritoneum, we deflate the bladder and take out. Then the cord pressure may be lifted up, and mm -hmm. baby will be alive. Right. But that's a very good point. Very good. Not, very good. Not, not more other cases, but then obviously since time, obvious. And you know when you start discussing, you can't just like take. I mean, you can't stop. So, so that's it for today. And uh, are there any questions to be answered? Uh, Rabni, can you just check out if there are any questions in the chat box? No open questions. No open questions. Good. 
actually there is there were i think there are there were some but i can't see them now they must have got their answers from the panelists yes maybe i think it was excellent we drew their questions uh, <laughs> it was very very well yeah. brought out dr renu rinku and all the panelists i think it was excellent thank you you know there are so many take home messages for all of us to learn as we go on in practice about your you know squatting and we've had some good experience with squatting left lateral all those things excellent very well brought out renu and rinku i think you people did a good job and all the panelists i brought out the subject so beautifully thank you so much really appreciate really appreciate Let's give a bit applause to the ring yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know. Actually, to uh, share with all of you, we have so many delegates with us. We had planned this almost like two months back when I first spoke to Renu, and I also had a word with Dr. Kamal Gujral. We sorted the whole thing out, and it just got deferred because of the, <clears throat> the pandemic. And I'm so happy that we all were at peace. and our uh, so many people the attendees are so many and they continue to be so we have all benefited thank <laughs> you a big applause to you both thank you thank you ma'am thank you dr renu thank you ma'am and a big thank you to all the panelists dr all manju dr shashi dr uh, divya dr deepthi all of you have done so yes. absolutely yes. great really good yes, really great. good was very well brought out basically what is our day day to day job isn't it that's what we are doing so yes i mean see mm. everybody gave spontaneous answers nobody knew any cases nobody had seen any cities but that ko bhi nahi pata tha madam aapne rinku se bhi share nahi kara tha the whole ppt she had not shared with me <laughs> very good bahut badhiya bahut hi badhiya madam bahut mazeka one teacher madam apne teacher wala kaam kiya nahi actually mere bhi teacher hai yahan pe manju ji <laughs> Dr. Manju Kibani is a real. <laughs> I would like to share something. The first thing I did was I looked up Dr. Manju's uh, article in the May twenty one yes, uh, bulletin. Yes, yes. I first <laughs> read the whole article very nicely. <laughs> Then I looked up Dr. Renu Mushra's book, which I had during my MD uh, post graduation days. So I dug out that book when she's mentioned wow. she was in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. <laughs> so I took out that book. And then you know, but still, I was so worried. But thank you so yes, much. Dr. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Dipti. Yes, so had good. May two thousand twenty-one yes. bulletin, which Dr. Dipti told me. Yes, I told everyone. सबसे पहले तो वो पढ़ लो. One 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 thing I want to say, you know, over here, which we missed out, you know, in this whole session. So if you read out the nice two thousand twenty-one bulletin yeah. pathway, yes, it's very confusing. It's not easy to remember everything I, and practice mm -hmm. it every day. But compared to that nineteen ninety, uh, sorry, two. The nineteen PQ is very simple. Yes, one yes. has to have that you know thing in your labor room mm. so that you know you can classify immediately. Because right now we have read we know after one month we'll forget. We'll forget. Mm. You know that I said. Just say that the RCOG guideline is that more than thirty minutes, yeah, less than thirty minutes, yeah, you yeah. cannot remember. Cannot remember. Oh, that was very difficult. Yes. So, but yes. actually, you just have to understand the gist of it. That yeah, if exactly. there are contractions, there are decelerations which which are worrisome. So, अगर वो थोड़ी देर आके ठीक हो जाए तो कोई बात नहीं है इफ दे कंटिन्यू यू हैव टू एक्ट सो लाइक रिंकू सेड यू हैव टू सी वेदर दिस बेबी इज हाइपोक्सिक वेदर आई नीड टू टेक बेबी आउट सो एट द एंड ऑफ टुडे दैट्स द बॉटम लाइन अब जो दैट्स द थिंग कि बेबी हाइपोक्सिक है या नहीं है बेबी रिएक्टिव है या नहीं है कॉम्पेंसेट कर रहा है कि नहीं कॉम्पेंसेट कर रहा है कि नहीं स्पेशली व्हेन यू यू नो यू हैव कंक्लूडेड दैट इट वाज नॉट द सीटीजी व्हिच वाज द वी हैव टू सी द पेशेंट इन कोर्ट नॉट फॉर एक्सट्रैक्शन Where and you the, use the Patwardhan technique, and you know it took a little while to take the simple measures like just changing the posture can do yes. so much. Yeah. So much. Changes. Madam, Patience. squatting. You know what you were what? saying, holding on to that. You be hold on to the table and make the patient squat. Not yes. Rest well, even the monitoring. Paper me position. Physiological. Hydration. Hydration. कोई नहीं देखता बिचारी पड़ी है घंटों घंटों पड़ी है उसको. हाँ. Huh. Yeah. Uh, because she's feeling because nauseating, she yeah. refuses to take anything. So we have to little, little things actually contribute. Yes. चलो बहुत मजा आया आपने. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Such a privilege to be on. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Really thank enjoyed. You. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for giving you. Doctor Payal, please, please, we have to thank Walter Bushtel. The vote of thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Vote of thanks by Doctor Payal, please. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. It is a great privilege for me to present the vote of thanks 
First of all, I would like to thank our mentors, Dr. Sharda Jain, ma'am, and Dr. Urmil, ma'am, for their constant guiding light and inspiring words. A big thanks to Dr. Gujral, ma'am, for your excellent coverage on antipartum surveillance. It was quite an enlightening talk, and you made our concepts really clear, ma'am. Thanks to Dr. Abha Sood, ma'am, and Dr. Harsha Kular, ma'am, for chairing the session so well. I thank Dr. Renu Mishra, ma'am, and Dr. Rinku Sen, ma'am, for moderating the program so skillfully and sharing your experiences and knowledge. I thank all the panelists, Dr. Divya, ma'am, Dr. Deepthi, ma'am, Dr. Manju, ma'am, and Dr. Sashi, ma'am, for broadening our horizon on intrapartum surveillance, which has always been a challenging task. It was quite an interactive discussion, ma'am. I extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ramneet. You were a wonderful host and you carried out the program so well. I thank Dr. Jyoti Bali, ma'am, and Dr. Shivani, ma'am, for their utmost efforts in organizing this webinar. Last but not the least, I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for Dr. Malvika, ma'am, for such an eye opening webinar. You are a true team leader, ma'am, and we salute you. Thanks to our beloved audience for being such an interactive and patient audience throughout the webinar. Lastly, thanks to Walter Bushner team for their logistics and technical support. Thank you, everyone. A special thanks to Walter Bushnell. They are always such a support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Malika. Thank you, Thank, thank you, ma'am, for giving us an Malika. opportunity to be Dr. associated Renu. with such kind of scientific taste, ma'am. We will continue we to be with you all. Thank you, ma'am. Have a great so evening much. ahead to all, ma'am. Everybody stay safe. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. yes. Stay safe, <laughs> ma'am. Thanks. It's Thank so important. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shashi. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Divya. We had a great time interacting with each other because, you know, some... <laughs> All of us were like, Tum pucho, hacha, Tum pucho, hacha, Tum pucho. <laughs> she even shared the CTG with us. <laughs> it, was so, it was so weird. You know, she just refused. She said, I'm not discussing it. 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 She said, No. You come as you are. That is what so the you people. Is. All yes. of you were great. All of you were so sharp and absolutely perfect. It was more like, you know, our PG exam is <laughs> <laughs> When you have that table thing, the table yeah. viva, oh, har ek jaga bhi jaji, come on now. <laughs> no, but it's really. so good. You know, we yeah. brush up. I remember, you know, when we had the vaccination program, Kiran told me, Kiran Guleria told me, ki, you know, you made me read so much. Yes. I feel so good about it. Yes. It actually helps. Hmm. So all Hi, Dr. Jyoti. Everybody. How are you? I'm yes, seeing you such a long time. I file, let me correct you there. It was totally ma'am's credit to have pulled off because me and Shivani are unable to do as per our expectations. So she oh, has Jyoti, to uh, your very presence was, willing to forgive. Jyoti, your presence was noted, my dear. Even Shivani. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, of course. But ma'am did everything because we weren't able to help her out at all during the Yeah, ma'am the ma'am called us two, three times. Yes. So it is yes. like Mary has a little lamb. She has to take all the lamb. No, 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 no. It's not that. All of you are very good. Uh, Jyoti, bahut mushkil se Shivani vichari bahar gayi hai. So, I know. Difficult. Yeah. No, I think all of us. I was also of no help. Together. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. We have so overshot good. our time totally, but yeah. the subject was so good. Yes. The audience was so good, you know. Yeah, they all stayed. Yeah. They all stayed. Yeah. We all benefited, you know. Yeah. It was benefited. worth it. We worth have all benefited. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank, you, our president. thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Jyoti. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am, for getting associated, giving us an opportunity.